fresh temptation sometimes arises with affliction and oppression, a hardness, numbness, and insensibility of the heart to everything true, good, and holy, we feel like a stone or a block, without faith, without the capability of praying, without hope in God's mercy, without love. How sad it is to feel like a stone or a log, without faith and love when we were created to believe, feel, hope, and love. And we must bear this patiently, and pray to God to roll away the stone of insensibility from the doors of the tomb of our heart, that he may take away from us a heart of stone and give us one of flesh. But what does this hardness or numbness in us signify? It shows the presence in our heart of the devil, who, having forcibly taken possession of our heart through our incredulity, thrusts out from it every good thought, not allowing it to rest there, and destroys all faith and every good feeling, making the man a burden even to himself. This really does happen to men. Let them learn what it signifies. Our various earthly service to our King and country is an image to our principal service to our King of Heaven, which must continue eternally. It is Him that we must truly serve before all, as His faithful servants through creation, redemption and His providence. Do the servants of the earthly country think of this? But we must think of it. Earthly service is a test, a preparatory service for the heavenly one, thou hast been faithful over a few things, I will make thee ruler over many things. Do not be unsparing judges of those who labor unto God and who fall in life, into contradiction to themselves, that is to their piety, they are placed in contradiction to themselves by the devil, their wicked adversary, he catches at their heart with his teeth, forcing them to do contrary things. Do not only do your work when you wish to, but do it especially then, when you do not wish to. Understand that this applies to every ordinary worldly matter, as likewise, and especially, to the work of the salvation of your soul, to prayer, to reading God's word and other salutary books, to attending divine service, to doing good works, whatever they may be, to preaching God's word. Do not obey the slothful, deceitful, and most sinful flesh, it is eternally ready to rest and lead us into everlasting destruction through temporal tranquility and enjoyment. In the sweat of thy face, it is said, Shalt thou eat bread. O miserable soul, carefully cultivate the talent granted unto thee, sings the Church. The kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force, says our Lord and Saviour. When your heart is disturbed in spirit by any passion, and you are deprived of peace, and are filled with agitation, and words of displeasure and animosity to your neighbour fall from your tongue, do not linger in this condition, so destructive to you, but immediately bend your knees and confess your sin before the Holy Ghost, saying from the depths of your heart, I have offended thee, Holy Ghost, by the spirit of my passion, by the spirit of evil and disobedience to thee, and afterwards say, from your whole heart and with the feeling of the omnipresence of the Spirit of God, the prayer to the Holy Ghost, O Heavenly King, the Comforter, Spirit of Truth, who art everywhere present and fillest all things, treasury of blessings and giver of life, come and make thine abode in me and cleanse me from all impurity, and save, O blessed one, my passionate and sensual soul and your heart will be filled with humility, peace, and devotion. Remember, that by every sin, by every attachment to anything earthly, by every displeasure and animosity towards your neighbor, by anything carnal, you offend the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of peace and love, the Spirit who draws us from the earthly to heavenly things, from the visible to the invisible, from the corruptible to the incorruptible, from the temporal to the eternal, from sin to holiness, from vice to virtue. O all Holy Spirit, our Ruler, our Instructor, our Comforter! Keep us through thy power. Holiness of the Father, Spirit of our Heavenly Father, implant in us, nurture in us, the Spirit of the Father, so that we may be His true children in Jesus Christ our Lord. When you are praying, watch over yourself, so that not only your outward man prays, but your inward one also. Though you be sinful beyond measure, still pray. Do not heed the devil's provocation, craftiness, and despair, but overcome and conquer his wiles. Remember the abyss of the Saviour's mercy and love to mankind. The devil will represent the Lord's face to you as terrible and unmerciful, rejecting your prayer and repentance, 
but remember the Saviour's own words, full of every hope and boldness for us, him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out, and come unto me, all ye that labour and are heavy laden with sins and iniquities, and the wiles and calumnies of the devil and I will give you rest. Man. The Creator's omnipotence, wisdom, and mercy, which were poured out upon the visible and invisible world, are ready to be bestowed, in all their infinity, upon you also, if you endeavour to be a true child of the Heavenly Father, if you fulfil His commandments to love God and your neighbour. Give yourself up, then, untiringly, and with all your might, to good works and deeds. Every person that does any evil, that gratifies any passion, is sufficiently punished by the evil he has committed, by the passion he serves, but chiefly by the fact that he withdraws himself from God, and God withdraws himself from him, it would therefore be insane and most inhuman to nourish anger against such a man, it would be the same as to drown a sinking man, or to push into the fire a person who is already being devoured by the flame. To such a man, as to one in danger of perishing, we must show double love, and pray fervently to God for him, not judging him, not rejoicing at his misfortune. Sin, instead of any arguments which it has not on its side, acts of violence, by wounding, by stinging us inwardly, by pouring into us the burning poison of sin. Blessed is he who despises all earthly things, and who is wounded by the love of God, by heavenly love but how few such men there are amongst the fallen sons of Adam. Who is not wounded and struck by the shafts of the passions, of gain and honours? And, vice versa, in whom are there the shafts of true love for God and his neighbour? The shafts of the passions and of sensual things have driven out the shafts of God's love, and do not leave room for them. For some persons these two elements are daily fighting against each other, and alternately thrust out each other, whilst in others there is not even a struggle, the earthly shafts reign wholly in some, stifling the heavenly ones, such, for instance, is the case with those who are greedy of gain, who are sensual, greedy of honours, drunkards, deceivers, murderers, fornicators, adulterers, etc. Oh, when will our hearts be wholly inflamed with love for the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, for the life, giving God the Trinity, who has commanded us to keep his commandments. Why do we trouble and torment ourselves at not receiving some treasure which we had expected, or at losing it? Because that which we expected or which we have lost, was the idol of our heart, because our heart has withdrawn itself from the Lord, the source of living waters, who alone can fill and give peace to it. Let us cling to God with our whole heart, and no earthly loss, no none, fulfilment of the expectation of any earthly good such as, for instance, money, marks of distinction, and others, which are outward and perishable things will grieve us. Let us learn to live an inward life. Let us turn our thoughts to the highest blessings, to the heavenly recompense which is alone desirable, true, and makes those who obtain it truly happy. We are generally delighted at fine, bright, warm weather, and like to talk about it, but in the heavenly abodes of the angels and saints the brightness, healthfulness, and freshness are incomparably greater. Why, then, do we not care to speak of the inmates of those dwellings of that life, of that brightness, of that blessedness? Joyful, life, giving, and bright is the sun, but the light of God's countenance, which the angels and the souls of the righteous rejoice in, is still more joyful, life, giving, and bright. Make us to be numbered with thy saints in glory everlasting. O Lord, save thy people and bless thine heritage, govern them, and lift them up for ever. Fervent, tearful prayer not only cleanses from sins, but also cures bodily infirmities and maladies, it renews the whole of a man's being, and makes him, so to say, born again, I speak from experience. O oh, what a priceless gift prayer is! Glory to Thee, the only, begotten Son of God, who hast obtained for us through Thy mediation the endless pardon of our sins. Glory to the All, Holy Spirit, who maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered who gives us ardent prayer with groanings and tears, who warms our cold souls and gives contrition and sorrow for sins, cleansing, sanctifying, pacifying, strengthening, and renewing us. 
Glory to Thee, Holy Trinity, which has no beginning, life, giving, eternally glorified by all reasonable creatures. It is impossible to bestow more upon you than God has bestowed upon you, for He has given you Himself, or His flesh and blood, united with His Godhead, He has made you His child, when you were the child of wrath and accursed, He has given you everything necessary, and outward blessings in abundance, and if He has not given you more outward blessings it is because they would have been harmful for you, for your soul and body. If, even now, you are often much harmed by these outward blessings by attaching yourself to them, and suffer misfortunes and injuries from the passions, by falling away from the love of God and your neighbor and the aspiration for higher things and descending to the lower ones, then what would it have been if you had still more of these blessings? You would have sunk into sensuality. Through the prayer of faith we can obtain from the All, merciful and All, bestowing God all spiritual and indispensable earthly blessings besides, if only the prayer is fervent, and the desire to obtain these blessings sincere. And what prayers the Church puts into our mouths. Such, that by means of them we can easily incline the Lord to be merciful to us and to bestow upon us every good gift. The enemy, knowing God's goodness and the power of prayer, endeavors by every means to deter us from it, or during the prayer tries to distract our minds, to hinder us by various passions and attachments to earthly things, or by hurry, disturbance, etc. When the heart is occupied with worldly things, especially superfluous ones, it forsakes the Lord the source of life and peace and is therefore deprived of life and tranquility, of light and strength, but when it repents of its care for vain things, and wholly turns from corruptible things to the incorruptible God, then the fountain of living water again begins to flow into it, and peace, tranquility, light, strength, and boldness before God and man once more dwell within it. We must live wisely. You do not want to pray for the man whom you hate and despise, but you must do so against your wish, and have recourse to the great physician, because you yourself are spiritually sick of the malady of malice and pride, your enemy or the one whom you despise is also sick, pray that the meek Lord may teach you meekness and patience, that he may teach and strengthen you to love your enemies, and not only your well, wishes, that he may teach you to pray sincerely for the evilly, disposed as well as for the well, disposed? Someone, when, during prayer, he became languid and feeble in mind and body, and longed to sleep, roused himself by the following inward question, with whom art thou conversing, my soul? And after this, by vividly representing the Lord before him, he began to pray with great feeling and tears, his blunted attention was sharpened, his mind and heart were enlightened, and he himself wholly revived. This shows what it is to represent the Lord God vividly to ourselves, and to walk in his presence. If he went on to say my soul, Thou darest not converse languidly and carelessly with men above thyself in station, in order not to offend them, then how darest thou converse languidly and carelessly with the Lord? Lord, how shall I glorify thee? How shall I praise thee for thy power, for the miracles of healing by means of thy holy mysteries, manifested upon me and many of thy servants, to whom I, an unworthy one, have administered these thy holy, heavenly, life, giving mysteries after the sacrament of penitence. They confess before me thy power, thy goodness, loudly proclaiming to all that thou hast stretched out thy wonder-working hand over them and raised them up from the bed of sickness, from their death, bed, when no one expected that they would live, and then, after the communion of thy life, giving body and blood, they soon revived, were healed, and felt upon them at the very same hour and day thy life, giving hand. And I, Lord, the witness of thy deeds, have not hitherto praised thee in the hearing of all for the strengthening of the faith of thy servants, and even do not know how and when to praise thee, for every day I am occupied with some kind of work. Create thyself a name, Lord, as thou hast done, glorify thyself, thy name, thy mysteries. Deny yourself sensual delights in the hope that, instead of them, you will obtain higher spiritual, heavenly delights. Do good to all in the hope that, in accordance with God's justice, with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again, that the good you have done to your neighbor shall be sooner or later returned into your bosom, 
just as the evil you have done him shall sooner or later be returned into your bosom. Remember that we are one body. We being many are one bread. Remember that God is just, to the highest degree, to an iota. Where would there be opportunities for struggling for great deeds if we were not occasioned injury by our neighbours, if they did not offend us? Where would there be opportunities for patiently bearing offences, for meekness and humility? You see, then, that we must be tried by many and various evils in order to prove our virtue and be eventually crowned. Do not be irritated either with those who sin or those who offend, do not have a passion for noticing every sin in your neighbour, and for judging him, as we are in the habit of doing. Everyone shall give an answer to God for himself. Everyone has a conscience, everyone hears God's word, and knows God's will either from books or from conversation with other people. Especially do not look with evil intention upon the sins of your elders, which do not regard you, to his own master he standeth or falleth. Correct your own sins, amend your own heart. Why does the Lord allow there to be poor? For your good, so that you may be cleansed from your sins and expiate them, for arms doth deliver from death, and shall purge away all sin, so that you may win suppliants who will pray for you in the persons of those upon whom you bestow your charity, so that the Lord may be merciful to you. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Why does the Lord allow people to be poor? For the same reason, amongst others, that he does not make you righteous all at once according to your wish. God might have made all men well off, even rich, but then a great forgetfulness of God would have arisen, and pride, envy, etc., would have increased. And you would have thought too highly of yourself had the Lord made you soon righteous. But as sin humbles you, showing you your great infirmity, impurity, and constant need of God and His grace, so likewise the poor man is humbled by poverty and his need of other people. If the poor were to be enriched, many of them would forget God and their benefactors, would ruin their souls in the luxury of this world. So destructive are riches, and so do they blind the spiritual vision. They make the heart gross and ungrateful. Thoughts in the street, during a walk, at the sight of the rising moon. I gratify you in everything, says the Lord. I have created you after mine own image and likeness, I have made the sun, the moon, and the stars shine for you, I have created the earth with all its fruits for you, I have diffused the air for you to breathe, I have given you fire to light and warm you, and to cook your food, I have given you various kinds of sweet food and drink, I have taught you how to make many and various tissues for your clothing, and have given you materials for this purpose, I have given you gold, silver, copper, and other metals in the bosom of the earth, for money and other objects, I have gathered you together in well, organized communities, I have given you a sovereign after mine own heart, mine anointed, my likeness upon earth, lastly, I have given you mine only begotten Son, have given him to die for you, have given him, by his own will, to you for food and drink. I have founded the church upon earth under his supremacy, what have you done and what are you doing for me? How do you recompense me for all my goodness? By forgetting me, by ingratitude towards me, by denying me, by despising my laws. O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Thy name, Lord, is almighty, because thou holdest not only heaven and earth, but also all mankind, the life of every man, the hearts of all in thy hand, and not only the life of every man, but also of every beast, bird, fish, insect, worm, reptile, and of every infusoria invisible to the eye. Glory to thine infinite omnipotence, Lord. Glory to thine all, merciful, most, wise, and all, powerful providence. Lord of heaven and earth. Almighty Sovereign. Thou likewise holdest in thy hand all hell, with Satan and his innumerable hordes, and it is only by thy permission, for our instruction and punishment, that Satan and his angels can lay their snares for us. As soon as we pray to thee our Saviour, as soon as we unfeignedly repent before thee of our sins, thou, having taught us, 
sendest away our enemies from us, saying, You have done enough evil to my servants, they belong to me again. Thus, Lord, if thine unceasing benefits and mercies to us do not teach us, what remains to be done? It only remains for thee to teach us by chastisement, by bitterness, by oppression, by fire, and by our own wickedness, we sensual men, who love space, freedom, vain carnal freshness, who are slothful, negligent, and evil by nature. The world is in a state of slumber, of sinful sleep. It sleeps. God rouses it by wars, by deadly epidemics, fires, destructive storms, earthquakes, inundations, bad harvests. We sing the angelic hymn to Thee, O Mighty One. Holy, holy, holy art Thou, O God. Through the Mother of God have mercy upon us. You thus praise God together with the angels. You are one assembly, one church, one family of gods with them by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore you ought also to live like the angels, in constant watchfulness over yourself and the souls of the spiritual children entrusted to your care. You must unceasingly praise and thank the Lord, you must be always striving after holiness, you must live in abstinence and fasting, in all humble, mindedness, obedience, and patience. May it be thus with you, by the Lord's grace. What shall I bring to thee, Lord, for all thy mercies which thou continually bestowest so bountifully upon me? My faith alone, for I have no works that shall justify me, I have done no good thing before thee. But even my faith is also thy gift. Receive thine own of thine own offered thee, for everything is thine, and we are all thine. Thou art our most perfect prototype. Of thine unspeakable glory I an image am, and though I bear offences scars, compassionate thy creature, Lord, and cleanse me in thy tenderness, and the desired fatherland give thou to me, a citizen of paradise me making once again. Take from us carnal passions, so that we, trampling upon all carnal lusts, may follow a spiritual manner of life, both thinking and doing always such things as shall well please thee. Lord. As it is natural to the prototype to attach, to assimilate to itself its images, to abide and to live in them, so, likewise, it ought to be natural to those who are created after thine image to yearn with all their love, with all their ardour, after their prototype, and to attach themselves to it. But our greedy, sensual flesh, gross and inert, withdraws us from thee. Fasting and abstinence are necessary for us whilst we crave after sensual gratifications. Strengthen us in abstinence. When Christ is in our heart, we are contented with everything, what has been discomfort to us becomes the greatest comfort, what was bitter to us becomes sweet, poverty becomes wealth, our hunger is satisfied, and our sorrow turns into joy. But when Christ is not in the heart, then the man is not contented with anything, he does not find happiness in anything, neither in health nor in comfort, nor in ranks and honours, nor in amusements, nor in rich palaces, nor in a luxuriously served table covered with all kinds of viands and drinks, nor in rich attire, in nothing. Ah! How necessary for the man is Christ, the life, giver and saviour of our souls! How necessary it is for Christ's sake, in order that he should dwell within us, for us to hunger and thirst, to sleep less, to dress more simply, and to bear everything with a quiet, peaceful, patient, meek spirit. The wicked fowler of our souls, the devil, seeks at every moment to ensnare our souls, trying how he can wound us by some sin, by some passion, how he can implant some sinful habit or passion more firmly within us, so as to make the salvation of our soul as difficult as possible, so as to produce in us a coldness towards God, towards holy things, towards the Church, towards eternity, and towards mankind. The Lord has created me, has brought me from non-entity into being, and after I had fallen, has restored me through his sufferings and death, he has cleansed me, a sinner, has made me his son by adoption, he has promised me the inheritance of eternal bliss, he has enlightened me through the light of his gospel, he punishes and forgives me like a father, he lights me with the sun, he gives me daily food and drink, and above all he gives me his sweetest and life, giving food, his body and blood. 
He has diffused air for me to breathe, and above all he has poured upon me his Holy Spirit. He clothes me in beauteous garments, above all, he inwardly clothes me with himself, as it is said, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. He gives me rest in a spacious and clean dwelling, and promises me an eternal, resplendent abode in the heavens, he endows me with health, above all, he gives me spiritual health in abundance, through prayer and especially through the holy sacraments and other means. What shall I render to him for all this? What can I do for him in return? I cannot do anything, except to be faithful to him with all my might, through fulfilling his commandments and by offering a firm and unchanging resistance to sin and the devil. If it were not for thy salvation, Lord, if it were not for thy beneficence, we should have burned in the furnace of our own passions, Satan would have finally corrupted and tormented us, and we should not have found any comfort or joy in life. If the Lord were not with us, we none could have withstood the enemy's attacks for they that overcome are thereby exalted. But now we are comforted by thy mercy, by thy grace, which thou hast won for us by thy sufferings, by thy blood, by thy death for us. Glory to thee for this, lover of men. But how will it be with those Christians who do not wish to know thee, thy commandments, thy teaching? Woe unto them! What would it be, my Lord and God, Jesus Christ, if the light of thy Godhead were to shine forth from thy most pure mysteries, when they rest upon the holy altar, or on the holy disk during the liturgy, or in the tabernacle, or in the pyx, when the priest carries them upon his breast going to or coming from a sick person? Before such a light, all those who saw it would prostrate themselves to earth in fear, for even the angels cover their faces from fear of thine inaccessible glory. But meanwhile, how indifferently some people behave towards these most heavenly mysteries! How carelessly some persons celebrate the terrible service of the holy mysteries! I must always remember my relation to God, on one side, as that of a creature to the Creator, as that of a work of art to the artist, of a potter's vessel to the potter, on the other side, as that of an image to its prototype, that of a child to its father, of one saved to the Saviour, of one loaded with benefits to the benefactor, of one who is under the law to the law, giver, of one who has entered into the testament to the giver of the testament, of one who is betrothed to the bridegroom, or of a bride to the bridegroom, of a member, of a citizen of the great city to its chief, of one looking for the ages to come to the father of those ages, of an accused to the judge. In everything and at every time strive to please God and think of the salvation of your soul from sin and from the devil, and of its adoption by God. On rising from your bed, make the sign of the cross and say, in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Ghost, and also, vouchsafe, O Lord, to keep us this day without sin and teach me to do thy will. While washing, either at home or at the baths, say, purge me with hyssop, Lord, and I shall be clean, wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. When putting on your linen, think of the cleanliness of the heart, and ask the Lord for a clean heart, create in me a clean heart, O God. If you have made new clothes and are putting them on, think of the renewal of the Spirit and say, renew a right spirit within me, laying aside old clothes, and disdaining them, think with still greater disdain of laying aside the old man, the sinful, passionate, carnal man, tasting the sweetness of bread, think of the true bread, which gives eternal life to the soul, the body and blood of Christ, and hunger after this bread, that is long to communicate of it often, drinking water, tea, sweet, tasted mead or any other drink, think of the true drink that quenches the thirst of the soul inflamed by passions, of the most, pure and life, giving blood of the Saviour, resting during the day, think of the eternal rest, prepared for those who wrestle and struggle against sin, against the sub-celestial spirits of evil, against human injustice or rudeness and ignorance, lying down to sleep at night, think of the sleep of death, which sooner or later will unfailingly come to all of us, of that dark, eternal, terrible night, into which all impenitent sinners will be cast, meeting the day, think of the nightless day, eternal, most bright, brighter than the sunniest earthly day, the day of the kingdom of heaven, at which all those will rejoice who have striven to please God, 
or who have repented before God from their whole life during this temporary life, when you are going anywhere, think of the righteousness of spiritually walking before God and say, Order my steps in thy word and let not any iniquity have dominion over me, when doing anything, strive to do it with the thought of God, the Creator, who has made everything by his infinite wisdom, grace, and omnipotence, and has created you after his image and likeness, when you receive or have any money or treasure, think, that our inexhaustible treasury, from which we derive all the treasures of our soul and body, the ever, flowing source of every blessing is, God. Thank him with all your soul and do not shut up your treasures within yourself, lest you shut the entrance of your heart to the priceless and living treasure, God, but distribute part of your property amongst those who are in want to the needy, to your poor brethren, who are left in this life so that you may prove upon them your love, your gratitude to God and be rewarded for this by God in eternity, when you see the white glitter of silver, do not be allured by it. But think that your soul should be white and should shine with Christ's virtues, when you see the glitter of gold, do not be allured by it, but remember that your soul ought to be purified as gold is, by fire, and that the Lord desires to make you yourself shine like the sun, in the eternal, bright kingdom of his Father, that you will see the Son of Righteousness, God, the Trinity, the Most, Holy Virgin, the Mother of God, and all the heavenly powers and saints, filled with ineffable light and shining with the light poured upon them. Lord! What shall I bring thee? How shall I thank thee for thy continual great mercies to me and the rest of thy people? For I am at every moment vivified by thy Holy Spirit. Each moment I breathe the air thou hast diffused, the soft, pleasant, healthful, strengthening air, I am lighted by thy life, giving and joyful light, both spiritual and material, I am nourished and my thirst is quenched by the sweetest life, giving spiritual food and drink, by the sacrament of thy body and blood, and with the sweetness of material food, and drink besides. Thou clothest me with the brightest, most splendid royal garment, with thyself, according to the Scripture, as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ and with earthly garments also. Thou cleansest me from my transgressions, healing and cleansing me also from my evil, sinful passions. Thou takest away my spiritual corruption, through the power of thy immeasurable holiness, wisdom, and might. Thou fillest me with thy Holy Spirit, the Spirit of holiness and grace. Thou givest righteousness, peace and joy, expansion, power, boldness, courage, and strength to my soul. Thou bestowest precious health upon my body. Thou teachest my hands to war and my fingers to fight against the invisible enemies of my salvation and blessedness, against the enemies of holiness and of the power of thy glory, against the subcelestial spirits of evil. Thou cronest me with success in my works accomplished in thy name. For all this I thank, glorify, and bless thy most gracious, fatherly, almighty power, God, our Saviour, our Benefactor. May the rest of thy people know thee as thou hast revealed thyself unto me, lover of men. May they know thee, thy grace, thy providence, thy wisdom and power, and glorify thee, with the Father and the Holy Ghost, now and ever, and to ages of ages. Amen. The unspeakable bliss of them that behold the infinite goodness of thy countenance. Earthly bliss all passes away by itself, and also through vicissitudes of human life, whilst joys of heavenly bliss will never end, will be infinite. Is it not worth while, therefore, to despise all the enjoyments of this transitory world, and of this still more fleeting life, in order to strive with the whole heart after spiritual, and unchangeable joys. It is madness for a Christian to be envious. In Christ we have all received infinitely great blessings, are all made godly, are all made inheritors of the unspeakable and eternal blessings of the kingdom of heaven. And we are also promised a sufficiency of earthly blessings, upon the condition of seeking the righteousness of God, and the kingdom of God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. We are commended to be contented with what we have, and not to be covetous. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. And it is added, For he, the Lord hath said, 
I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Is it not, therefore, madness, after this, to envy your neighbor anything, for instance, his honors his wealth, his luxurious table, beautiful clothing, his fine house, etc. Is not all this mere dross in comparison to that which has been given us in the image and likeness of God, according to which we were created, in our redemption by the Son of God from our sins, from the curse and from death, in the bestowal upon us again of the blessing of our Heavenly Father, and in the eternal heavenly joys united with it. Therefore let us strive to acquire mutual love, goodwill, and contentedness with what we have, friendship, hospitality, love for the poor, for the stranger, and to attain to the summit of virtues, humility, meekness, gentleness, and holiness. Let us respect the image of God in each other, the members of Christ, our God, His body, God's sons by adoption, the citizens of the kingdom of heaven, the dwellers with, and companions of, the angels in praising God. That they may be one, as our God, worshipped in the Holy Trinity, is Himself one, and has created our hearts as one for unity, that is, simple, single. All present things are but a shadow of the future. The present light is a shadow of the future ineffable light. Earthly bliss is a faint shadow of future unspeakable, eternal bliss, fire a faint shadow of the fire of Gehenna, which will burn sinners unto ages of ages, pure earthly joy a shadow of unspeakable future joys, the magnificent royal palace is a faint shadow of the resplendent mansions of paradise prepared for those who love God and fulfill His commandments. The glorious attire of the sons and daughters of men cannot be compared with that glorious garment with which the elect shall be clothed, for they will put on Christ. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of the Father, according to the Saviour's sure promise. As a child is indifferent to whatever clothes are put on it, so also the Christian, an infant in Christ, should be indifferent to the variety, richness, and beauty of his earthly garments considering Christ, our God, his best and incorruptible garment, for an attachment to expensive, fine clothes is peculiar to the children of this world and to the heathen, as the Lord says, for after all these things that is, food and fine raiment do the Gentiles seek, for dress is the idol of the children of this world. Oh, how vain and frivolous are we, we who are called to communion with God, to whom is promised the inheritance of incorruptible and eternal blessings. How obscure is our understanding of corruptible and incorruptible blessings. How unwise we are in valuing worthless things and not prizing incorruptible blessings, our immortal soul, peace, joy, boldness before God, holiness, obedience, patience in general, all the qualities of a true Christian. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Therefore we must value spiritual blessings and valor, and despise material things as corruptible and worthless. The sin of inattention is one to which we are, in a great degree subjected, we must not disregard it, but must repent of it, we give ourselves up to inattention, not only at home, but also in church. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. The causes of inattention are, the devil, and our manifold attachment to worldly, earthly things, its reason is, want of faith, the means to overcome it, fervent prayer. There is no happiness for me on earth save the Lord Jesus Christ, with his Father and the Holy Ghost. He is my sole blessedness upon earth. After God, there is nothing on earth dearer to me, as it should be, than the human soul, it is dearer than anything else. Man is a precious being. God himself came down from heaven upon earth for his salvation. To man he gives for food and drink his most pure body and blood, all himself, only that he may become blessed, that he may not be lost. Are the fruits of the earth, the treasures of all the three kingdoms of the earth, he is given into the dominion for the use and pleasure of man. By all these immeasurable bounties the Lord has shown, and still shows, that he infinitely loves mankind, and every man separately. Let us, too, imitate God's love and bountifulness, let us be, as far as possible, merciful and bountiful, as our Heavenly Father is merciful.
Wherever I look with my spiritual vision, whether within me or upon me, or outside of me, everywhere, I see powerful reasons for thanking and praising the Lord. Especially when I look only within myself, then I see the strongest reason for doing so. The whole strength of my heart, all my spiritual light, comes from God, all my bodily strength, everything that serves to maintain my bodily life, comes from God. Everywhere I see the glory the sole glory, of my God, and see nothing in myself of which I could boast as of my own. Glory to Him who gives me strength. Glory to Him who works through me, and within me. As I have nothing of my own, and have everything from God, down to the smallest good inclination of my heart, down to every holy and bright thought, whilst without God I am nothing, worse than this, I am all evil, therefore I have the strongest reasons to have recourse to God in prayer for everything. I have especially powerful reasons to thank, God for His most pure and life, giving sacrament, His body and blood, it is everything to me. I fervently praise the Lord Jesus Christ, our God, for His unspeakable love to us mortals, revealed in the Holy Sacrament. What an immeasurably great honour it is to mankind, that they can open their lips before God, that they can converse with Him, and are able to make request to Him of their needs, to thank Him for His benefits, to praise His unspeakable magnificence, and to be assured that this sacrifice of thanksgiving and praise is agreeable to God, that our highest spiritual requests to Him relating to the salvation of our souls are always fulfilled. How immeasurably high is man exalted in this respect above all other sentient and animate creatures. No other creature has received such honour from God, though they, too, have tongues, expressing the needs of their nature, for it is said that young ravens call upon him. Let us, therefore, make use of this great honour, in order to be worthy of a still higher honour from the Lord, of the heavenly calling. There, in heaven, shall be our full glory, whilst here its beginning only is revealed to true Christians. On account of our corporeity and spirituality, the Lord unites His grace, even Himself, to everything visible and material, and works through everything, thus He transforms bread and wine into His own body and blood, or into His visible tabernacle. He changes the temple into His own house, upon the altar in the temple He invisibly sits, enthroned as a king, upon the cross he manifests himself, as though in the same body in which he was crucified, and works miracles by means of the cross, showing his life, giving power through it. He is everywhere throughout the universe, as in a temple, and, at the same time being holy everywhere, is not limited by any space, being always above every space and time. You marvel that he can unite his own self, or his power and his saving grace, to matter. Marvel, first of all, how he has united in man his godly image with matter, with earth and dust, how this dust can think, speak, and diffuse around itself the fragrance of goodness, righteousness, truth, and love, and can accomplish in the common life so many wonderful, truly wonderful, deeds. Marvel also at how many various kinds of speechless souls are enclosed in the dust, gifted with some kind of sense, with a thirst after life and joy, with a feeling of self, protection, the capacity for finding themselves food, for constructing what is necessary for their safety, and for bringing their children into the world, and understanding how to defend themselves cleverly. Marvel how nearly all inanimate bodies are united with invisible, intangible powers, which sometimes move their enormous masses, as with the heavenly bodies, sometimes turn them into beautiful, and always identical, unchangeable forms, as in plants. Marvel that so many different powers are created by God, for all powers are derived from the one single power, and the Almighty Himself works through every power. Truly, everything appertaining to God the Creator, as to the God of wonders, is wonderful, likewise in faith, everything is wonderful, though invisible, but true and real. The pure in heart shall see God. God is an all, seeing eye, a spiritual sun, standing above the world, penetrating with his spiritual eyes into the thoughts and hearts of men, enlightening every creature. Our soul is an eye from the eye, sight from the sight, light from the light. But now, since our fall into sin, our eye, our soul, 
is diseased through sins. Take the cataract off your eye, and you will see the spiritual sun, the everlasting eye, ten thousand times brighter than the material sun. How often it happens in life that a man has one thing in his heart and another upon his lips, and wears two faces at one and the same time. It is thus also during prayer, before God himself, who knows the secrets of the heart, a man also frequently wears two faces, saying one thing and having another in his heart and thoughts. If, which happens still oftener, when saying a prayer, although he understands it and thinks about it, he does not sympathize in his heart with that which he is saying, being dead, and thus throwing the words to the air, then he deceives himself if he believes that he can please God by such a prayer. This is strange, sinful duplicity. It is a bitter fruit, and evidence of our fall into sin. It seems habitual to our heart to lie in prayer and in our intercourse with other men. The heart is a pillar of falsehood. All men are liars. The Christian must make use of every means in order to eradicate every falsehood from his heart, and to implant pure truth within it. We must begin with prayer, as with a matter in which truth is indispensable before everything, in accordance with the Lord's own words, worship Him in spirit and in truth. Speak the truth from your heart. When we have learnt to speak the truth from our heart during prayer, we shall not allow ourselves to lie in our everyday life, sincere, true prayer, having cleansed our heart from falsehood, will protect it against falsehood in our relations with other men in worldly matters. How can we teach ourselves to speak the truth from our heart during prayer? We must bring every word of the prayer down to our heart, lay it to heart, feel its truth in our heart, be convinced of all our need of that for which we ask God in prayer, or of the need of hearty gratitude for His great and innumerable benefits to us, and of most heartfelt praise for His great, most wise works in His creation. Everything that constitutes me man, the soul, lives solely by God, and only in union with Him, whilst when the soul separates itself from God, then it experiences extreme distress. But the life of my soul consists in the peace of my spiritual powers, and this peace proceeds exclusively from God. There is, it is true, carnal peace also, but it is a delusive one the forerunner of spiritual storm, of which the Lord says, when they shall say, to men, peace and safety, then suddenly destruction cometh upon them, but spiritual peace, which proceeds from the Spirit of God differs, as heaven from earth, from such carnal peace. It is heavenly bliss giving. Peace I give you, often said the Lord to his disciples, giving them his peace, and the apostles also gave peace to believers, and wished them God's peace as the highest blessing, because God's peace constitutes the life of our soul, and witnesses to the union of our soul with God. The absence of peace in the soul, disturbance, by which all the passionate conditions of our soul are distinguished, is spiritual death and the sign of the action of the enemy of our salvation in our hearts. Faith is the key of God's treasury. She dwells in simple, kind, loving hearts. All things are possible to him that believeth. Faith is a spiritual mouth, the more freely it opens the greater the stream by which the divine springs enter into it, let this mouth freely open, as your bodily one does, do not let your lips be compressed by doubt and unbelief, if you compress them by doubt and unbelief, the treasury of God's blessings will be closed to you. The more openly, the more heartily you believe in God's omnipotence, the more bountifully will God's heart be opened to you. What things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them and ye shall have them. All men are the breath and the creation of the one God, from God they have come forth, and to God, as to their origin, they will return, then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return unto God who gave it. That by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. As the breath of the one God, and as having proceeded from one man, men ought, naturally, to live in mutual love, mutually caring for one another, and ought not to be divided from each other by selfishness, pride, malice, envy, avarice, or unsociability of character, that they may be one. Look at the ants, how friendly they are, look at the bees, how friendly they are, 
look at the flights of pigeons, doors, rooks, crows, geese, ducks, swans, sparrows, how friendly they all are, look at a flock of sheep, and in general at any horned cattle, how friendly they all are. Think of the innumerable shoals of some sorts of fishes in the seas and rivers, which always like to move in shoals, how friendly they are. Think also how zealously they all take care of each other, help each other, love each other, and be shamed by the dumb creatures, you who do not live in love with others and flee from the obligation of bearing one another's burdens. God is long, suffering and merciful to you, this you experience many times every day. Be long, suffering and merciful to your brethren, also fulfilling the words of the Apostle, who thus speaks of charity before everything, charity suffereth long, and is kind. You desire that the Lord should rejoice you by his love, rejoice on your part the hearts of others by your tender love and kindness. God is love, a most, gracious, all, wise and omnipotent being. Therefore, those who pray must believe that the Lord will give all things needful, bountifully, as he is loving, and bountiful wisely, as he is all, wise, and as he is omnipotent, there and then, when we do not expect. During divine service, during the celebration of all the sacraments and prayers, be trustful, as a child in relation to his parents. Remember what great fathers of the Church, what inspired luminaries, enlightened by the Holy Ghost, are guiding you. Be simple, trustful, undoubting as a child in godly matters. Cast all your care upon the Lord, and be entirely free from sorrow. Take no thought how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father, which speaketh in you. The Lord has long ago freed us from this care, this sorrow, having taught our God, fearing fathers by His Spirit, what to say and how to pray to the Lord at divine service, at the celebration of the sacraments and upon various other occasions and circumstances of human life, requiring prayer to bring down a blessing from above. It ought to be easy for us to pray. Only the enemy troubles us. But what matters is troubling if our heart is firmly established in the Lord. It is only a misfortune if we do not rest in God, if there is no firm faith in us, if we have bound ourselves by worldly attachments, if our intellect is proud and presumptuous, then, even in the most holy, most pure matter of service, at the celebration and communion of the holy mysteries, the enemy will greatly hinder us. Be as kind, meek, humble, and simple as possible in your intercourse with all, considering yourself not hypocritically inferior to all in respect to your spiritual condition, that is, more sinful and weaker than all. Say to yourself, of all sinners I am the first. From pride proceeds self-sufficiency, coldness, and insincerity in our behavior to our inferiors, or to those from whom we do not expect to obtain any advantage. How quick we are to evil and how slow to good! Now I desire to do good to my enemy, and to really show him kindness, but before I succeed in becoming kind in my heart, I am already evil, a fiery arrow of evil already inwardly burns one, I wish to be patient, but before I have strengthened my heart in patience, I become irritable, impatient, I wish to be humble, but Satan's pride has already found ample room in my heart, I wish to be gracious, meanwhile, when it is necessary to show graciousness, I show myself rough, I wish to be unmercenary and generous. But cupidity and avarice, upon the least occasion, like hungry and roaring lions, require to be fed, I wish to be simple, trustful, but cunning and doubt already gnaw at my heart, I wish to be grave, concentrated, and reverent in my service to the Almighty, but light, mindedness and inattention of the heart prevent my becoming so, I wish to detach myself from earthly things, to be abstinent in food and drink, but when I see pleasant food and drink and sit down to table, I, like a slave, am taken a willing captive by my belly, I easily allow myself to eat and drink more than my nature requires, greediness and intemperance again prevent and get the better of my desire to be indifferent to food and drink, thus I am like that impotent man who lay for thirty, eight years upon his bed, and came many times to the pool of Bethesda, which made whole whosoever first stepped in after the troubling of the water by an angel, 
but always another step down before him. And when I, having become impotent through my sins, make an effort and come to myself, with the intention of immersing myself in God and of changing for the better, another steppeth into my heart before me, sin and the devil forestall me in my own house, in my own pool of Bethesda, and do not allow me to reach the source of living waters, the Lord, do not allow me to immerse myself in the cleansing pool of faith, humility, heart, felt contrition and tears. Who will heal me then? Jesus Christ alone. When he sees my sincere and firm desire to be healed of my spiritual infirmity, when he hears my fervent prayer, then he will say to me, Take up thy bed and walk, and I shall rise from the bed of spiritual infirmity and walk, that is, by his grace I shall easily vanquish all my passions and fulfill every virtue. During prayer, intentional, deliberate, extreme humility is indispensable. We must remember, who speaks and what he says, this is especially necessary during the Lord's Prayer, Our Father, humility destroys all the snares of the enemy. Ah! How much secret pride there is in us! This, we say, I know, this I do not need, this is not for me, this is superfluous, in that I am not a sinner. How much sophistry of our own! When you pray, say in your heart, against the various thoughts and provocations that come from the enemy, the Lord is everything to me. Likewise, during all your life, when passions attack you, and during every oppression of the enemy, and during sickness, afflictions, misfortunes and disasters, say, the Lord is everything to me, I myself can do nothing, cannot bear anything, cannot surmount, conquer anything, He is my strength. Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed. O contemptible shame! O devilish shame! O stink of Satan's ascending from the well of the abyss! How many are diseased with it! How many do not recognize its enticement and become enslaved by it, to the ruin of their souls! Look at worldly writers, journalists writers of few letters. They write, 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 of what will they not write during their literary career? But of God, of our Saviour, Jesus Christ, of the Church, of divine service, of the Christian festivals, of the resurrection of our body, of the judgment, of the life beyond the grave, they do not even make mention. They say it is not their province, not their business. We are of the world, we speak of worldly matters, and therefore the world listens to us, but if we were to speak of God, perhaps nobody would read what we write. Thus worldly literature is completely foreign to the spirit of Christianity, it even seems to be ashamed of the spirit of Christ. The devil cunningly induces us, instead of irritating us against himself, to notice our neighbor's sins, to make us spiteful and angry with others, and to awaken our contempt towards them, thus keeping us in enmity with our neighbors, and with the Lord God himself. Therefore, we must despise the sins, the faults themselves, and not our brother who commits them at the devil's instigation, through infirmity and habit, we must pity him, and gently and lovingly instruct him, as one who forgets himself, or who is sick, as a prisoner and the slave of his sin. But our animosity, our anger towards the sinner only increases his sickness, oblivion, and spiritual bondage, instead of lessening them, besides this, it makes us ourselves like madmen, or sick men, the prisoners of our own passions, and of the devil, who is the author of them. Every sin proceeds from the spirit of evil, he who sins is the slave of sin, is tortured by sin, therefore, do not be too severe, but be gentle with him who sins, knowing our common infirmity. Pity the sinner, as one who is sick, or who has lost his way, and is walking in darkness, or as one who is bound with iron fetters, as one whose mind is deranged, for all these qualities may be attributed to a sinner, or to one who is under the dominion of some passion. It is necessary to watch over such a man in every way, so that the fire of sin should not burn him, should not darken him, should not bind him, should not plunge him into sickness, should not destroy him. We are accustomed to the works of God, and therefore value them but little, we do not, for instance, value even man as we ought to, that greatest work and miracle of God's omnipotence and grace. 
Look upon every man, whether he is one of your household, or a stranger to you, as upon something perpetually new in God's world, as upon the greatest miracle of God's omnipotence and grace, and do not let the fact of your being accustomed to him serve as a reason for you to neglect him. Esteem and love him, as your own self, constantly, and unchangeably. Sometimes in nature a warm, healthful wind blows, pleasantly and lightly, permeating and coming in contact with the body, and the sky is serene, whilst at other times a cold wind blows, one feels, somehow, distressed and feverish, the wind pierces to the very bones and affects the body unpleasantly, the earth and sky are darkened, or else sometimes the state of the atmosphere is warm and warmth, giving, and at other times cold, benumbing. It is likewise in the spiritual life, sometimes our soul is surrounded and penetrated by a light, pleasant, warmth, giving, vivifying breath, we feel ourselves happy and tranquil, whilst at others our heart is touched by a heavy, deathly breath, accompanied by complete spiritual darkness. The first state proceeds from the Spirit of God, the second from the devil. It is necessary to accustom ourselves to everything, as in the first case, not to grow self-conceited, so in the last, not to fall into despondency, into despair, but to fervently have recourse to God. If men had not been created according to the image of God, the Lord would not have been incarnate of the Most Holy Virgin. Oh how our nature is raised, both in its creation and in its redemption. Through the incarnation of the Son of God from the Most Holy Virgin Mary, God has most, truly united Himself with men. O oh Thou, by Thy glorious birth, giving hast united God, the, word with men, and linked our apostate nature with heavenly things. Glory to Thee, who art meetly praised by every reasonable creature, for Thou hast obtained from God such grace and purity that Thou wert able, through favour of God the Father, by the operation of the Holy Ghost, to give flesh to the Son of God. Make us also worthy, O Lord, to attain purity of spirit and body through the communion of the divine mysteries of the body and blood of Thy Son. Through His Incarnation the Lord has entered into the closest relation with man. It is marvellous. God Himself is united in one person with man. God became flesh, the Word was made flesh. God Himself partook of our carnal food and drink, was laid in a manger, lived in a house. He who cannot be contained by the heavens walked upon the earth, upon the waters, upon the air. He went up, it is said, toward heaven. He was nailed to the tree, he who hangeth the earth upon nothing by his command. The whole earth, the waters, and the air, all are sanctified by the incarnate Son of God, therefore the earth is dear to him, this temporary abode of men, this inn of the human race, this place of his habitation amongst men. But especially dear to him are men themselves, whose souls and bodies he has received into unity with his own person, and especially with true Christians. He is in them, and they in him. What is above all desirable for man? The avoidance of sin, the remission and forgiveness of sins and the attainment of holiness. Wherefore? Because sins, such as, for instance, pride, evil behavior towards our neighbors, wicked suspiciousness, covetousness, avarice, envy, etc., separate us from God, the source of life, withdraw us from fellowship with other men, and plunge us into spiritual death, whilst gentle, humble, and kind behaviour to all, even to our enemies, simplicity, disinterestedness, contentedness with little and with the indispensable, generosity to everyone, goodwill and all other virtuous qualities unite us to God, the source of life. And to other men by endearing us to them. Grant then, Lord, that we may entirely flee from sin, that we may accustom ourselves to every virtue, through thy grace. Yea, Master, Lord, without thee we, being evil, can do no good thing. We must not be exasperated, angry, and proud, as is habitual to our corrupt nature, against those who are angry, envious or proud towards us, but we must pity them as overcome by the flames of hell, and by spiritual death we must pray to God for them from the depths of our hearts, that the Lord may take away the darkness from their souls and enlighten their hearts by the light of His grace. 
we are darkened by our own passions, and do not see the foolishness, the monstrousness of them, and of our conduct, but when the Lord enlightens us by the light of His grace, then we, awaking us from a sleep, clearly perceive the monstrousness, the foolishness of our thoughts, feelings, words, and actions, our heart, which was hardened until then, softens, the evil passes away and is replaced by mercy, kindness, and indulgence. Therefore, in accordance with our Saviour's words, we must also love our enemies, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you, and persecute you, for they, our brethren are also blind, have also gone astray. This present life is a life of exile, the Lord God, it is said, sent him forth from the Garden of Eden, and we, all of us, must earnestly strive to regain our country through repentance and works meet for repentance. Lord, the desired fatherland give thou to me, a citizen of paradise me making once again. The present life is the narrow way, the way of afflictions, privations, and maladies. The narrower the way, the more convincing, the surer it is, that we are going the right, true way, the wider, the more certain it is that we are nigh to destruction. The present life is a daily, cruel, most bitter struggle against the enemies of our salvation, especially against the invisible, sub, celestial spirits of evil, who do not leave us in peace for a single day, but constantly make use of their craft and subtlety against us, kindling various passions within us, and wounding us in the most acute manner by their shafts. Remember, therefore, that an incessant war is waged against us, that there is not time to rest, to enjoy, and amuse ourselves in this life, which is given us for our preparation for the future one, neither when we are tried by misfortunes, nor even then, when it seems to us we are perfectly easy and happy, as, for instance, when we give ourselves to pleasure at theatres or soirees, when we display ourselves in festive attire and ornaments, when we give ourselves up to the pleasures of the table, when we turn round in the gay dance, drive in fine equipages, etc. Amidst all your worldly pleasures, man, the greatest misfortune hangs over you. You are a sinner, you are God's enemy, you are in great danger of losing eternal life, especially if you live negligently, if you do not do works meet for repentance. The wrath of God hangs over you, especially if you do not appease the God whom you have offended by your prayers, penitence, and amendment. Thus, this is no time for you for pleasures, but rather for tears, your pleasures should be rare, and principally such as are afforded you by faith, in spiritual festivals. God is an almighty power over all material worlds. More than that, He is a most wonderful, most merciful, and most just power over the spiritual world, that is, the world of angels and men. In His hands are all spirits, their peace and blessedness, as well as the anguish and torments of evil spirits and evil men. As we sometimes blaspheme the divinity by the impure, dark, and evil state of our soul, blaspheme the Father, the Word, and the Most Holy Ghost, the Comforter, so, on the contrary, some men, through the benign disposition of their souls, are capable of comforting all by their words, thus glorifying the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost the Comforter, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. The Almighty Lord. His omnipotence embraces all creatures, the highest and the lowest, intellectual and sentient, angels and men, heaven and all that is therein, the earth and everything upon it, the sea and everything within it. His omnipotence absolutely embraces everything in general and every part of creation. Thus it embraces the heart of man and his thoughts, therefore it is said, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. This is also why the Apostle says, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. If God's grace leaves my heart and my mind I become as the dust carried away by the wind, without any moral stability, with an inclination to every possible evil, both my mind and my heart become empty, trivial, dark, and powerless. The Virgin Mary is the most merciful sovereign of all the sons and daughters of men, as the daughter of God the Father, who is love, the mother of God the Word, of our love, 
the chosen bride of the Holy Ghost, who is love consubstantial with the Father and the Word. How can we do otherwise than have recourse to such a sovereign and expect to receive all spiritual blessings from her? Firmly purpose in your soul to hate every sin of thought, word, and deed, and when you are tempted to sin resist it valiantly and with a feeling of hatred for it, only beware lest your hatred should turn against the person of your brother who gave occasion for the sin. Hate the sin with all your heart, but pity your brother, instruct him, and pray for him to the Almighty, who sees all of us and tries our hearts and innermost parts. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. It is impossible not to often fall into sin unless you have a hatred of it implanted in your heart. Self, love must be eradicated. Every sin comes from the love of self. Sin always appears, or feigns to be, to wish us well, promising us plenteousness and ease. The tree was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. This is how sin always appears to us. If guardian angels did not preserve us from the snares of evil demons, oh how often we should have fallen from one sin into another, how devils would have tormented us, they who delight in tormenting men, which indeed happens when the Lord allows the guardian angels to withdraw themselves from us for a time, and devils lay snares for us. Yes, the angels of peace, our true guides, the guardians of our souls and bodies, are ever with us if we do not voluntarily drive them away from us by the abomination of sensuality, pride, doubt, and unbelief. We somehow feel that they cover us with the wings of their immaterial glory, only we do not see them. Our good thoughts, inclinations, words, and deeds, all proceed from them. The enemy often wounds our souls by his malice and burns us. This wound spreads like a gangrene in the heart if we do not stop it in time by the sincere prayer of faith. And God wounds our souls by his love, but this wound is light, sweet, not burning, but warming and vivifying. Concerning Penitence. Penitence should be sincere, perfectly free, and not in any way forced by any particular time and habit, or by the person before whom the sinner confesses. Otherwise it would not be true penitence. It is said, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven, is at hand. Is at hand, that is, it has come by itself. It is not necessary to seek for it long, it seeks us, our free inclination, that is, you yourself must repent with heartfelt contrition. They were baptized of him, is said of those baptized of John confessing their sins, that is, they themselves acknowledged their sins. And as our prayer consists principally of penitence and asking forgiveness of our sins, it must absolutely be always sincere and perfectly free, not against our will, not forced out of us by habit and custom. Such also should be our prayer when it is one of thanksgiving and praise. Gratitude supposes the soul of the man benefited to be full of free, lively feeling flowing freely from the mouth, for out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. Praise, too, supposes an ecstasy of wonder in the man who contemplates the infinite goodness, wisdom, and omnipotence of God in the moral and material world, and therefore it ought also to be a perfectly free and intelligent action. In general, Prayer should be a free and perfectly conscious outpouring of the man's heart before God, I have poured out my soul before the Lord. In order to purify and stimulate our prayer, the Lord allows the devil to painfully inflame our inward parts, so that we, feeling a strange fire within us, and suffering from it, may endeavor to bring into our heart by means of humble prayer the fire of God, the fire of the Holy Ghost giving life to our hearts. The law allows the enemy to tempt us in order to prove us, in order to strengthen our spiritual powers in our struggle against the enemy, and so that we ourselves may see more clearly towards what our heart inclines, whether it inclines to patience, hope, and love and in general to virtue, or to irritability, incredulity, murmuring, blasphemy, malice, and despair. Therefore we must not be despondent, but must good, humidly and patiently bear spiritual darkness that descends upon our soul, the fire that weakens and inclines us to impatience and malice, the affliction and oppression, 
knowing that all these are indispensable in the order of our spiritual life, that by these the Lord is proving us. Do not let us blaspheme against the true way the way of holy faith and virtue, and do not let us prefer the evil way. We are free, and must strengthen ourselves by every means and with all our power in faith and virtue, unto the laying down of our life for the way of truth, and how can this be if we have no temptations? The devil strikes the hearts of priests with slothfulness, dryness, and barrenness, in order that they should not preach the truths of the gospel to God's people, should not tell them the entire will of God. During prayer he also works upon the heart, and strikes it with insensibility, so that the prayer should not be sincere, but only said out of habit, he does not let the heart contemplate during prayer the greatness of all God's perfections, the greatness, of the mother of God, that of the angels, and of God's saints. The devil is like a wicked, sharp, pointed needle, which, at every time and everywhere, gets into the eyes of your heart, dimming and eclipsing them, he is the poisonous dust which always flies about our spiritual atmosphere and settles corrosively upon our hearts, eating them up and piercing them. He acts in the same manner upon some teachers of religion, striking their hearts with dryness and oppression, in order that they may not teach God's truths sympathetically to the young branches of Christ's vine, nor water them with the life, giving streams of the gospel. Here is a society of men of the world, they go on talking and talking, for the greater part amusing themselves with trifles, and there is no mention of God the common Father of all of His love for us, of the future life, of recompense, why is it so? Because they are ashamed to speak of God. But what is still more surprising is that even persons deeming themselves pious, themselves luminaries, seldom speak of God, of Christ the Saviour, of the preciousness of time, of abstinence, of the resurrection from the dead, of judgment, of future bliss and everlasting torments, either in their family circle or amongst men of the world, but often spend their time in futile conversations, games, and occupations. This is, again, because they are ashamed to converse upon such subjects, being afraid to weary others, or fearing that they themselves may not be able to converse heartily upon spiritual subjects. O, oh, adulterous and sinful world! Woe unto thee at the day of judgment by the universal and impartial judge! He came unto his own, and his own receive him not. Yes, the Lord and Creator of all is not received by us. He is not received into our houses, nor into our conversations, or, else, when a man reads a religious book or prayers aloud, why does he sometimes do so as if against his will, reluctantly, his tongue hesitating? His mouth speaketh not out of the abundance of the heart, but out of straightness and emptiness it can scarcely speak at all. Why is this so? It proceeds from the neglect of reading books and of prayer, and from false shame sown in the heart by the devil. What miserable creatures we men are! We are ashamed of that which ought to be regarded as the highest honour. O, oh, ungrateful and evil, natured creatures! What torments do we not deserve for such conduct? When the enemy does not succeed in hindering the Christian upon the path of salvation by means of afflictions, oppression, poverty and various other privations, maladies, misfortunes, then he rushes to the other extreme, he fights against him by his own health, tranquillity, softness, the weakness of his heart, the insensibility of his soul to spiritual blessings, or by the opulence of his outer life. Oh, how dangerous is this last condition! It is more dangerous than the first state the state of affliction, oppression, of sickness, etc. In such a state we easily forget God, we cease to feel His mercies, we slumber and spiritually sleep. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. But in affliction we involuntarily turn to God to be saved, we constantly feel that God is the God of our salvation the God who saves that He is our life, our breath, our light, our strength. Thus, it is better for the Christian to live in some or other kind of affliction. Prayer is, spiritual breathing, when we pray we breathe in the Holy Ghost, praying in the Holy Ghost. Thus, all church prayers are, the breathing of the Holy Ghost, as it were spiritual air and also light, 
spiritual fire, spiritual food and spiritual raiment. Holy Ghost, all we Christians are, thy breath, thy birth after baptism, by thy first creative breathing into the person of the first man, we, all races of the earth, are, thy breath, thy birth. Have mercy upon us, raise us up, Holy Ghost. Drive away from us by thy breathing the stench of our sins and passions, and uproot all our sinful inclinations. During prayer always firmly believe and remember that every thought and word of yours may, undoubtedly, become deeds. For with God nothing shall be impossible. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. This signifies that even your words, shall not be without power. All things are possible to him that believeth. Take heed of your words, the word is precious. Every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. The word is the expression of the truth, the truth itself, being and deed. The word precedes every being, everything, as the cause of their being, past, present, or future. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. Thus speaks the creative word of the Father. In Him, in the Word, is the cause of all creatures, present, past, and future. Why do we honour the cross with such reverence that we make mention of its power in our prayers after asking for the intercession of the Mother of God and the heavenly powers, before asking for that of the saints? and sometimes even before asking for that of the heavenly powers. Because, after the Saviour's sufferings, the cross became the sign of the Son of Man, that is, the cross signifies the Lord Himself, incarnate and suffering for our salvation. On the cross Christ offered Himself as a sacrifice to God the Father for our sins on the cross, and by it, He has saved us from the works of the enemy, and this is why we honour it with such great reverence and therefore it will always be a great power for believers, delivering them from every evil, and especially from the evil action of invisible enemies. As light, air, and water are found together and mutually penetrate each other and, at the same time, do not intermingle, each of them remaining what it was before, the light remaining light, the air air, and the water, each entirely preserving its own particular properties, but the substance forming one matter, so also, in a somewhat similar manner, the persons of the Most Divine Trinity are always found together, and are not separated from each other. The Father is in the Son, and the Son in the Father, whilst the Holy Ghost proceedeth from the Father and resteth in the Son. But at the same time each person has its own particular properties, God the Father is not begotten, not created, does not proceed, the Son is begotten, the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father, whilst the substance of the three persons is one, a divine, incomplex substance. This similarity is based upon the words of our Lord Jesus Christ Himself, who calls Himself the light of the world, and thus speaks of the Holy Ghost, comparing it in its actions to the element water, He that believeth on me, as the Scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake He of the Spirit, which they that believe on Him should receive. He also compared the Holy Ghost to the air or wind, the wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth, so is every one that is born of the Spirit. The Holy Church sings of the Holy Ghost, to the Holy Ghost belongs every all, saving cause. On whomsoever he, through worthiness doth breathe, he quickly taketh him from earthly things. It is the same to the Lord to give flesh to any creature he likes, either to an animal or a plant, as it would be to me to make a garment or clothing and put it on myself, thou hast clothed me with skin and flesh, and hast fenced me with bones and sinews. And what an infinite multitude, and variety of material the Lord has, out of which he, the Creator, creates various clothing, of various shapes for his creatures, animals, birds, fishes, reptiles, insects and us he will eventually clothe with light, like unto of the sun in his kingdom. Upon thy right hand, did stand the queen in a vesture of gold. Then shall the righteous shine forth, as the sun in the kingdom of their father. 
And now we are clothed with the earth, water, air, warmth such is our present clothing. And how wisely and conveniently all these elements are made and brought into union in our being. It is not heavy, and it is comely. O, oh, most, wise and almighty artist! Life, giving artist! How beautiful, suitable, and animate is everything that thou hast created! At thy will even the dust is animate, the dust moves. The chief thing in prayer for which we must care above all is lively, clear, sighted faith in the Lord, represent Him vividly before yourself and within you then ask of Jesus Christ in the Holy Ghost whatever you desire and you will obtain it. Ask simply, without the slightest doubt then your God will be everything to you, accomplishing in an instant great and wonderful acts, as the sign of cross, accomplishes great wonders. Ask for both spiritual and material blessings not only for yourself, but for all believers, for the whole body of the Church, not separating yourself from other believers, but in spiritual union with them, as a member of the one great body of the Church of Christ, and loving all, as your brethren or children in Christ, as the case may be. The Heavenly Father will fill you with the great peace and boldness. When praying, pay steadfast attention to the words of the prayer, feeling them in your heart. Do not withdraw your mind from them to any other thoughts. When praying during divine service, during the celebration of the sacraments and the singing of the prayers and hymns upon various occasions, lay surely to your heart the words themselves of the church prayers, believing, that not a single word is placed there in vain, that every one of them has its power, that in each word dwells the Holy Trinity the Lord Himself, who is everywhere present and fills all things, think thus, I myself am nothing, the Lord does everything. Also think, when I speak God the Word, speaks in me. I need be careful for nothing. Casting all your care, it is said, upon him, for he careth for you. When you read a worldly magazine or newspaper, it is light and agreeable reading, you easily believe in everything in it. But if you take up a religious publication or book to read, especially one relating to church matters, or sometimes when you begin reading prayers you feel a weight upon your heart, you are tormented by doubt and unbelief, and experience a sort of darkness and aversion. Many acknowledge this. From what does it proceed? Of course, not from the nature of the books themselves, but from the nature of the readers, from the nature of their hearts, and chiefly from the devil, the enemy of mankind, the enemy of everything holy, he taketh away the word out of their hearts. When we read worldly books, we do not touch him, and he does not touch us. But as soon as we take up religious books, as soon as we begin to think of our amendment and salvation, then we go against him, we irritate and torment him, and therefore he attacks us and torments us on his side. What can we do? We must not throw aside the good work, the reading or prayers that are profitable to our souls, but we must patiently endure, and in patience save our souls. In your patience possess ye your souls, says the Lord. The same applies to theatres and churches, to the stage and divine service. Many people find it pleasant to go to the theatre, and oppressive and dull to go to church. Wherefore? Because in the theatre everything is well suited to please the sensual man, and when we are there we do not provoke the devil, but please him, and he, on his side, affords us pleasure, and does not touch us. Make merry, my friends, thinks he laugh, only do not remember God. Whilst in the church everything is adapted to arouse faith and the fear of God, pious feelings, the feeling of our sinfulness and corruption, and the devil sows in our hearts doubt, weariness, despondency, evil, impure and blasphemous thoughts so that the man is not glad in himself, and cannot stand for even an hour, and he gets away as quickly as possible. The theatre and the church are opposite contrasts. The one is the temple of the world, and the other the temple of God, the one is the temple of the devil, and the other the temple of the Lord. When you are asked to pray that someone may be saved from bodily death, for instance, from drowning, from death through any sickness, from fire, or from any other disaster, commend the faith of those who ask you to do so, and say in yourself, Blessed be your faith, according to your faith may the Lord fulfill my unworthy, 
feeble prayer, and may he increase my faith. You easily forgive yourself, if you have sinned against God, or against men, accordingly easily forgive other people too. Love your neighbor as yourself, forgive him much. How oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times? I say not unto thee, until seven times, but, until seventy times seven, said the Lord. By this love is known. Even this is little for love to do, love loves its enemies, does good to them which hate it, blesses them that curse it, and prays for them which despitefully use it. The Lord, unto whom all hearts are open, knowing our avarice and trivial, covetous calculation in those cases, when we have to show hospitality and kindness to people, from whom we do not expect to receive the equivalent, has promised to remunerate us in the day of judgment, not only for having given food to the hungry, drink to the thirsty, for having visited the sick and those in prison, but he has promised a reward even for a cup of cold water, given to a Christian or to an unbeliever in his name. Whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water only. Verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. O, oh, the loving, kindness, and mercy of Christ! Who, after this, will not be ashamed of the hardness of his heart, and his shameful avarice? The devil, as a spirit, as an incomplex being, can hinder and wound the soul by a single instantaneous movement of the thought of wickedness, of doubt, blasphemy, impatience, irritation, malice, by an instantaneous movement of any attachment of the heart to anything earthly, by a movement of intuitive sight, adultery and other passions he can fan the spark of sin, with the cunning and malice peculiar to him, into a flame, raging with infernal strength within the man. We must stand fast and strengthen ourselves by every means in God's truth, rejecting the lies, illusions, and malice of the devil, at their very beginning. In such cases, the man should be all watchfulness, all eyes, hard as adamant, invincible in every part, firm and invulnerable. O, oh, glory, glory to thy victory, Lord! Thus may I conquer, by the power of thy might, the invisible and visible enemies, all the days of my life, until my last breath. Amen. O, oh, simplicity of faith, do not leave me. Do not have any partiality, not only either for food and drink, for dress, for a spacious and richly decorated dwelling, for the luxurious furniture of your house, but not even for your health, do not even have the least partiality for your life, give up all your life to the will of the Lord, saying, For, to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He that hateth his life in this world, shall keep it unto life eternal. Attachment to the temporary life, to one's own health, leads to many deviations from God's commandments, to the indulgence of the flesh, to breaking the fasts, to evading the conscientious fulfillment of the duties connected with our service, to despondency, impatience, irritability. Never sleep before saying evening prayers, lest your heart should become gross from ill, time sleep, and lest the enemy should hinder it by a stony insensibility during prayer. Be sober, be vigilant. Watch and pray, that ye enter not into temptation. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh, at even, or at midnight, or at the cock, crowing, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you I say unto all, watch. Pray, my brethren, to the mother of God when the storm of enmity and malice bursts forth in your house. She, who is all, merciful and all, powerful, can easily pacify the hearts of men. Peace and love proceed from the one God, as from their source, and Our Lady, in God, as the Mother of Christ the Peace, is zealous, and prays for the peace of the whole world, and above all, of all Christians. She has the all, merciful power of driving away from us at her sign the sub, celestial spirits of evil, those ever, vigilant and ardent sowers of enmity and malice amongst men, whilst to all who have recourse with faith and love to her powerful protection, she soon speedily gives both peace and love. Be zealous yourselves also in preserving faith and love in your hearts, 
For if you do not care for this, then you will be unworthy of the intercession for you, of the Mother of God, be also most fervent and most reverent worshippers of the Mother of the Almighty Lord, for it is truly meet to bless her, the ever, blessed, the entirely spotless Mother of our God, the highest of all creatures, the Mediatrix for the whole race of mankind. Strive to train yourself in the spirit of humility, for she herself was more humble than any mortal, and only looks lovingly upon the humble. He hath regarded the low estate of his handmaiden, said she to Elizabeth, of God, her Saviour. Do not let the devil sow enmity and malice in your heart against your neighbour, do not let these feelings nestle in any way in your heart, otherwise your malice, even if not expressed in words, but shown only in your glance, may infect through sight the soul of your brother also, for nothing is so infectious as malice, it easily infects especially those who have in their hearts an abundance of unslumbering malice, and fans the spark of evil in them into a whole flame. Be watchful, with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. For, nothing is secret, that shall not be made manifest, neither anything hid, that shall not be known and come abroad. Cultivate the Christian art of doing good, of heartily blessing those who curse you, by which you will please your Lord Christ, who said, Bless them that curse you. Love your enemies sincerely, not regarding their enmity, but respecting in them the image of God, according to which they are created, and seeing in them your own self. Do good to them which hate you, as the Son of the Heavenly Father, who is kind even unto the unthankful and to the evil, believing that you will overcome evil with good, because good is always more powerful than evil. Pray for them which despitefully use you, so that through your prayer you may save them also, by God's grace, from the evil malice and the snares of the devil, and save yourself too from misfortune. Give to every man that asketh of thee, and of him that taketh away thy goods ask them not again, for everything comes from God, and, should the Lord will, he can take everything away from you. Remember, that you yourself have come naked out of your mother's womb, and naked shall you return thither, and shall not take anything away with you. If you will thus live, you will gain for yourself the priceless treasure of peace and love, and shall live long on the earth, for the meek, spirited, it is said, shall possess the earth, and shall be refreshed in the multitude of peace. I look to Thee alone, Lord, with my spiritual vision. I believe in Thee undoubtingly. Thou Thyself knowest how and what to give me. Thou art, the treasury of every blessing, Thou art, mercy, wisdom, and omnipotence abundantly flowing upon all creatures. Thus I also look to Thee, O Holy Virgin. Intercede for and have mercy upon me thyself. Do not grow despondent and enfeebled in spirit, seeing the constant struggle within you of evil against good, but like a good and valiant soldier of Jesus Christ, our great founder, struggle courageously against evil, looking at the crown, prepared by the Lord for all who conquer evil in this world and in their flesh. To him that overcometh, will I grant to sit with me in my throne in order not to remember the malice of your neighbour against you, but to pardon him with all your soul, remember, that you, yourself, are not free from malice, as well as from all other passions. Recognise your neighbour's infirmities and passions as your own, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Oh, how sinful I am, how loathsome I am by my sins in the eyes of God, of men, and even in mine own. Who can be more loathsome to me than myself? Truly nobody, in comparison to me all are righteous. I must be unmercifully angry with myself, and must consider it a special happiness to forgive my neighbour's trespasses and offences against me, an unworthy one, so that the long, suffering, bountiful, and merciful Lord may forgive me even some of my trespasses. I must remember, that it is only by this that I can become deserving of the Lord's mercy to me, otherwise I ought long to have ceased to live. Oh, how full of misery, of difficulties, and how grievous is this earthly life! From morning till night, daily, we must carry on a grievous warfare against the carnal passions, fighting against our soul, against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places, whose craft and subtlety are immeasurably evil, 
infernally artful, indefatigable. O, oh, sweetest Saviour, Thou who calleth unto Thyself all those who labour and are heavy, laden, to give them rest. Thou seest, our heart and bosom are wasted from this daily struggle and affliction, we are unnerved, weakened, we walk like shadows. Our evil enemies continually vex our souls, and endeavour by every means to draw us into the abyss of despair. Stretch forth, Master, Thy mighty right hand, and deliver us from the snares of the dragon of olden time, the murderer of men. If any man will come after me, said the Lord, let him deny himself, and take up his cross daily and follow me. But who is the daily cause of our cross, our afflictions and distresses? The old carnal man, and the devil with his continual snares. To look unto the Lord during the struggle against any passion, or after having committed any sin and repented of it, gives peace to our doubting hearts, and a wonderful brightness to our countenance. Thou hast put gladness in my heart, Lord, lift Thou up the light of Thy countenance upon us? Oh, how bright does our countenance become when we look upon the God of our hearts by the exertion of our faith, with our spiritual vision. Truly, then the Lord Himself is with us, as He said, Call upon me in the day of trouble, I will deliver thee. I will be with him in trouble, I will deliver him and honour him. O, oh, thou most, bountiful and long, suffering God, thou who art ready to pardon unto seventy times seven the sins and transgressions of all those who heartily repent and ask thy forgiveness, have mercy upon us, who every hour offend many times against thee. Amen. What infinite nothingness our food and drink represent on the one side, and what infinite grandeur the man himself who is fed by them represents on the other side. Is it not the greatest insanity for man, for his image of God, for this partaker of the divine nature, for whom God may be all, God may be all in all to grudge food, drink, clothing, dwelling, and anything else earthly. Let the dust be dust, but let the immortal image of the immortal God be always exalted and preferred before everything earthly, corruptible and transitory. Therefore, do not let us be sparing of anything for our neighbour. Oh, what a great honour it is, to feed, to clothe, to give rest to the image of God. Most, gracious and most, bountiful God. Fill our hearts with mercy and bountifulness. God's saints had the eyes of their understanding enlightened, and with these eyes they clearly saw the wants of our sin, corrupted nature, clearly saw for what we should pray, for what we should ask, for what we should give thanks, how we should praise the Lord, and they left us the most perfect examples of prayers of various kinds. Oh, how beautiful these prayers are! Sometimes we do not feel and do not know their value, whilst we well know the value of food and drink, of fashionable attire, of well, furnished rooms of theatres of music, of worldly literature, especially of novels, that fluent, empty mass of words and, alas! We trample under feet the precious pearls of prayer, and whilst everything worldly finds a welcome, wide shelter in the hearts of most people, prayer alas! does not find even a narrow corner in them, cannot get into them. And when it begs us to let it in, it is thrust out like a mendicant, like the man who had not a wedding garment. Rejoice at every opportunity of showing kindness to your neighbour as a true Christian who strives to store up as many good works as possible, especially the treasures of love. Do not rejoice when others show you kindness and love consider yourself unworthy of it, but rejoice when an occasion presents itself for you to show love. Show love simply, without any deviation into cunning thoughts, without any trivial, worldly, covetous calculations, remembering that love is God Himself. Remember that He sees all your ways, sees all the thoughts and movements of your heart. Do not let pass any opportunity for praying for any man, either at his request or at the request of his relatives, friends of those who esteem him, or of his acquaintances. The Lord looks favourably upon the prayer of our love, and upon our boldness before him. Besides this, prayer for others is very beneficial to the man himself who prays for others, it purifies the heart, strengthens faith and hope in God, and enkindles our love for God and our neighbour. When praying, say thus, Lord, 
it is possible for thee to do this or that to this servant of thine, do this for him, for thy name is the merciful lover of men and the Almighty. If ye, then, being evil, know how to give good gifts, not only, unto your children, but also to strangers, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give all possible good things to them that ask him? Glory to thee, Lord, our Father, most wise prover of my love for thee and my neighbour. Do not leave me without the temptations which are necessary and beneficial in accordance with thy wisdom and truth, not for a single day of my life. May they confirm, strengthen, and increase my love for thee and my neighbour, and may I not appear poor and empty before thy face at the day of thy judgment. If I, a weak man, when I wish to do anything within the limits of my capability am able to do it, for instance, if I wish to write a book, I write it, if I wish to cure an illness, I cure it, if I wish to make anything, I make it, for instance, if I want to build a house or a church, I build such a house or church, or if I say to another man, come, and he comes, go, and he goes, do this and he does it then cannot God, the Almighty, do everything that he may desire. As for our God, he is in heaven, he hath done whatsoever pleased him. If sometimes a man only says two words, that something shall be, and it really comes to pass, though, perhaps, not at once, but after a certain time, then will not everything be done at once that is commanded by the word of the Creator? Will not everything that he desires be done at once at a single word from him? For he spake the word, and they were made, he commanded, and they were created. We are not creators of men, yet they do so much at our word, we are not creators of things, yet, in accordance with our wishes and acts, they take thousands of shapes and serve for our innumerable requirements and pleasures. We do not create matter, but we create both great and small objects from matter. Cannot, therefore, the Creator, who is everywhere present, and fills all things, at whose word all things came from none, existence into being, by whose thought, by whose will, and by whose word all the infinite varieties of things were created and exist, create anything he desires. If a human physician can sometimes bring back to life a half, dead person by means of the knowledge of his profession, and skillful, well, directed action upon the cause of the illness, cannot, therefore, the creator of physicians and of the science of healing cure, at his single wish and word, every illness. Cannot the Creator even raise the dead at his single word? Let us render glory to him, we of little faith, and let us say to him from our hearts, All things are possible unto thee, Lord, and nothing is impossible to thee. Amen. O thou Almighty Sovereign, to whose single sign all things, the whole visible and invisible world, are obedient, grant that I may unceasingly glorify thee by the simplicity of my faith in thine infinite power. Give me the faith that will not be ashamed, firm hope, and unfeigned love for thee and my neighbour. He, God, is before all things, and by him all things consist. A great, immeasurable meaning is contained in these words. They explain the name of I am that I am, by which name the Lord named himself to Moses. For I am signifies him who exists before all things, and by whom all things exist. These words, show the infinite omnipotence and grace and the immeasurable wisdom of the Lord our God. Great is our Lord, and great is his power, and his wisdom is infinite. If, being in an assemblage of men, you call a person known to you, and he comes to you, if you ask one or many men subservient to you to do anything for you within the limit of his or their capability, and they fulfill your request, satisfying it according to your desire, and even beyond your desire, then be assured that, likewise, in God's church, in that great house of God divided into two halves the heavenly and the earthly, any of the members of the church in heaven whom you call upon will come to your spiritual help conformably to his grace, and the abundance of his love. Ask him to do anything for you that you please, especially anything relating to the kingdom and righteousness of God, and he will do it through his close association with God, the source of grace and power. God's saints also hear you as, for instance, the whole congregation hears you when you pray or speak the word, for they are in the Holy Ghost, 
and the Spirit is everywhere present, and tills all things. Our self, love and pride manifest themselves especially in impatience and irritability, when some of us cannot bear the slightest unpleasantness intentionally, or even unintentionally, caused us by others, or obstacles lawfully or unlawfully, intentionally or unintentionally, opposed to us by men, or caused by the objects surrounding us. Our self, love and pride would like everything to be as we wish, that we should be surrounded by every honor and comfort of this temporal life, would like all men, and even, how far is pride carried. All nature itself, to speedily and silently obey a sign from us, whilst, alas! We ourselves are very slow to faith and to every good work, slow to please the one master of all. Christian. You must absolutely be humble, meek, and long, suffering, remembering that you are clay, dust, nothingness, that you are impure, that everything good that you have is from God, that your life, your breath and everything you possess are God's gifts, that for your sins of disobedience and intemperance you ought now to redeem your future blessedness in paradise by the long, suffering which is indispensable in this world of imperfections and innumerable transgressions of the fallen men living together with us. And forming the numerous members of the one sin, sullied human race. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. He who is impatient and irritable does not know himself and the human race, and is unworthy of the name of Christian. In saying this, I pronounce judgment against myself, for I am the first of those who are afflicted with impatience and irritability. Our life is children's play, only not innocent, but sinful, because, with a strong mind, and with the knowledge of the purpose of our life, we neglect this purpose and occupy ourselves with frivolous, purposeless matters. And thus our life is childish, unpardonable play. We amuse ourselves with food and drink, gratifying ourselves by them, instead of only using them for the necessary nourishment of our body and the support of our bodily life. We amuse ourselves with dress, instead of only decently covering our body and protecting it from the injurious action of the elements. We amuse ourselves with silver and gold, admiring them in treasuries, or using them for objects of luxury and pleasure, instead of using them only for our real needs, and sharing our superfluity with those in want. We amuse ourselves with our houses and the variety of furniture in them, decorating them richly and exquisitely, instead of merely having a secure and decent roof to protect us from the injurious action of the elements, and things necessary and suitable for domestic use. We amuse ourselves with our mental gifts, with our intellect, imagination, using them only to serve sin and the vanity of this world, that is, only to serve earthly and corruptible things, instead of using them before all and above all to serve God, to learn to know Him, the All, wise Creator of every creature, for prayer, supplication, petitions, thanksgiving and praise to Him, and to show mutual love and respect, and only partly to serve this world, which will some day entirely pass away. We amuse ourselves with our knowledge of worldly vanity, and to acquire this knowledge we waste most precious time, which was given to us for our preparation for eternity. We frequently amuse ourselves with our affairs and business, with our duties, fulfilling them heedlessly, carelessly, and wrongfully, and using them for our own covetous, earthly purposes. We amuse ourselves with beautiful human faces, or the fair, weaker sex, and often use them for the sport of our passions. We amuse ourselves with time, which ought to be wisely utilized for redeeming eternity, and not for games and various pleasures. Finally, we amuse ourselves with our own selves, making idols out of ourselves, before which we bow down, and before which we expect others to bow down. Who can sufficiently describe and deplore our accursedness, our great, enormous vanity, the great misery into which we voluntarily throw ourselves? What answer shall we give to our immortal King, Christ our God, who shall come again in the glory of His Father to judge both the quick and the dead, to declare the secret thoughts of all hearts, and receive from us our answer for every word and deed? Oh, woe, woe, woe to us who bear the name of Christ, but have none of the Spirit of Christ in us, who bear the name of Christ, but do not follow the teaching of the Gospel. Woe to us who neglect so great salvation. 
Woe to us who love the present fleeting, deceptive life, and neglect the inheritance of the life that follows after the death of our corruptible body beyond this carnal veil. One of the infirmities of the human spirit is its slowness to faith and its slothfulness in acquiring a knowledge of the truth, especially of the truths of faith and piety. What do use, and even grown, up and elder people, study most inertly and slothfully? The truths of faith and piety. This is proved by innumerable experiences. In order that men should esteem and love each other, should not be proud, should not be arrogant to each other, the most wise Lord has given to different men different natural and beneficial advantages, so that they may have need of each other. In this manner each one of us must involuntarily acknowledge this or that infirmity and humble himself before God and men. Lord, Thou Thyself hast said by Thy most pure lips, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. I long to be perfect. Be Thou therefore every perfection for me, for Thou hast also said, For without me ye can do nothing. All prayers assume the great poverty and misery of our fallen nature, they also assume that the Lord is the ever-flowing source of every perfection, every blessing, that He is our inexhaustible treasury. Truly, we must have poverty of spirit, during prayer and at all times. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Consider how great is man, God dwelleth in him, and he in God, so that in a pious Christian it is as though not a man but Christ himself lives. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, because the whole soul becomes Christ's, as iron in a furnace itself becomes fiery like a burning coal, it is all fire, all light, all warmth. Preserve a meek and peaceable disposition towards your brother, even when he cunningly or artfully, or somehow unintentionally deprives you of all you possess. Show then that you love God's image in him more than anything earthly and perishable, that your charity never faileth. Of him that taketh away thy goods ask them not again. And if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. Do not let the enemy shame you for laying your hopes upon such earthly dust as money and food, more than upon God, but shame him himself by your firm trust in God and in his holy word. For man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Mark, by every word. For every word of the Lord Creator can support your life, just as every word can create and transform thousands of creatures. For he spake and it was done, he commanded and it stood fast. Thus at his word he brought from none, existence into being the myriads of the immortal heavenly hosts, and having sanctified them by the Holy Ghost, strengthens and supports them in their being. Do not foolishly lower the dignity of your immortal spirit by vainly trusting in earthly dust. Say, my trust is in God, or the Father is my trust, the Son is my refuge, the Holy Ghost is my protection. O, oh, Holy Trinity, glory to Thee! And yet how many of us become irritated and lose their temper when they are deprived, not of their last coin, but only of some small part of by no means their last property. How much agitation, anger, bile, bitter reproaches, murmuring, sometimes even curses. Righteous God! Can this dross called money, or this food and drink produce such storms in our Christian souls, in us who know the words of our sweetest Saviour? Take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Behold the birds of the air, they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Or, a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. My God! To what have we come? In what are we better than heathens in our mode of life? Where is our faith, our trust in God, our love for our neighbour? O, oh, pride of Satan! O, oh, what shame is ours! Heavenly Father! Thou who knowest what things we have need of, and givest them to us before we ask Thee, have mercy upon us unfaithful, ungrateful, and evil, natured ones. 
Lord, we hear thy merciful words, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, but being daily tempted by earthly blessings, we do not heed them, and transgress thy will. Do not fear bodily privations, but fear spiritual privations. Do not fear, do not be faint, hearted, do not be irritated when you are deprived of money, food, drink, enjoyments, clothes, dwelling, even of your body itself, but fear when the enemy deprives your soul of faith, of trust, and love for God and your neighbor, when he sows hatred, enmity, attachment to earthly things, pride, and other sins in your heart. Fear not them, men, which, will kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But thou art the same, and thy years shall have no end, is said of the unchangeableness of God. Oh, if you, men, were always the same, to, day, to, morrow, the day after to, morrow and so on, and if you did not change in a thousand ways like a kaleidoscope. Oh, if you too were always equally peaceful, kind, simple, amiable, patient, industrious, benevolent, and generous. But you can be such if by hearty faith and love you unite yourself to the unchangeable. For I am the Lord, I change not. I preserve my servants from falling into evil, for I am the source of mercy, benefiting those who serve me worthily. Peace is the integrity and health of the soul, to lose peace is to lose spiritual health. Reverence with all the powers of your soul all the sacraments, and say to yourself in respect to every sacrament before the celebration or the communion of it, this is God's mystery. I myself am only the unworthy witness or partaker of it. Otherwise, our proud intellect even wishes to search out God's mystery, and, if unable to penetrate it, rejects it as not coming under the small measure of our intellect. If a single word of an earthly king causes great deeds to come to pass in his kingdom, he speaks and the work begins and is accomplished, then will not the word of the Lord of all material and spiritual, visible and invisible creatures, accomplish everything he desires? Shall he speak and it not be created? Shall he speak and it not be done? O, oh, Almighty Power, able to accomplish everything in one single moment, do not leave us on account of our sins, and above all on account of our incredulity and despair, to be tormented by our own infirmities, lest we be destroyed like earthen vessels. Grant that we may believe with all our hearts in thine almighty power, that we may not doubt in the fulfillment of our every right request. All visible nature, all its parts, great and small, down to the very smallest, at every instant remind us that everything has proceeded from the Lord, and exists and moves by Him, that everything is or comes into being through Him, and at each moment obeys Him. Oh, how low has our nature fallen through our passion for eating! Oh, thrice accursed Satan, who has precipitated us, and still precipitates us, through food, into thousands of evils! Oh, food and drink, that so powerfully tempt us! How long shall we be allured by you and place our life in you? When shall we engrave deeply upon our hearts the Saviour's words? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God, and bring these words into our life and actions. How long will our greediness, self, indulgence, surfeiting, and drunkenness continue? How long will our abominable avarice and love of money continue? How long will our pride, animosity and malice against our neighbor, through money, dress, houses, food, and drink last? Thousands of Satan's deceits, by means of food, dress, and money, disclose themselves to our spiritual vision, and yet we still continue to be allured by his enticements as though by something real, useful to us, whilst in fact we are caring for neither more nor less than destructive illusions, and for that which is most pernicious both spiritually and bodily to our own selves. Do not believe, brethren, in the enemy's enticements, not for one single moment, when the matter concerns food and drink, however plausible they may apparently be. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. I spake not to you concerning bread, that ye should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees, which is hypocrisy, 
in matters of faith and piety. Pay the utmost attention to faith and piety. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. Give away even the last that you have, if there is need of it, remembering the words of the Saviour, If any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also that is, give away the last that you have. After their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears. Is not this what men of the world, and even many of the clergy are now doing? Do they not choose for themselves teachers that flatter their hearing? They do not learn of the one teacher, Christ, from his gospel and his church, but they learn of worldly journalists, novelists, poets, actors and exclaim, Ah, how interesting all this is, how instructive it all is. And say, if not in words, then by their deeds, we have no need of either the gospel or the church, with its services, its sacraments, and preaching of God's word. We have such good, such most moral teachers. Lord, Jesus! To what have we come? they have cast thy words behind them. Do not be despondent and do not fall into despair when you feel within your soul the deadly breath and ferment of malice and evil, impatience and blasphemy, or any weakness from impure thoughts, but fight against them unremittingly and endure valiantly, calling with all your heart upon the Lord Jesus, the conqueror of hell. Humble yourself deeply, deeply, acknowledging yourself from the depths of your soul as the first of sinners, unworthy of human fellowship, and the Lord, seeing your humility and your struggle, will help you. Call also to your help the speedy Mediatrix, the Most Holy Virgin, the Mother of God, saying, Heal, Most Pure Lady, the many painful wounds of my soul, and strike the enemies constantly fighting against me. If you truly call God your Father, then trust in Him as in the One Father, Most Merciful, Almighty, most wise, unchangeable in his love and in his perfections. Trust in him in respect to the blessings of this temporal life, but especially in respect to granting you future blessings in Christ Jesus. Engrave deeply on your heart the words, God is my Father. Our Father, which art in heaven, but as through the love of the Heavenly Father for you, you yourself have become the child of God, as having come forth from him, as possessing reason and free will, you ought, on your part, to use all your efforts to attain the blessed and eternal heavenly inheritance, you ought to know and always remember that you are a fallen being. And as you fell possessing reason and freedom, fell by your own will, then by that same reason, which is enlightened by the light of the Word of God and the divine light of the Holy Ghost, by that same free will, strengthened by the grace of the Holy Ghost in Christ Jesus, rise up from your fall and go forward without stopping towards the heavenly, endless life, despising all earthly things as perishable and quickly passing away, and especially not attaching yourself to silver and gold, to food and drink. Through which such a depth of evil has fallen upon all the human race. Thank our most speedy Mediatrix, Our Lady, the Mother of our Lord, the most pure, most good Virgin Mary, for saving us through our fervent prayers from the harassments and oppression of the devil. Look up to her, with the eyes of your heart, in the Holy Ghost, who is everywhere present, fills everything, and who is incomplex. Look up at her as being close to your very heart, and call upon her, Most Speedy Lady Mediatrix, Mary, Mother of God, save me from the enemy, the disturber. And immediately, in an instant, she will save you according to the faith of your heart, according to your soul's trust in her, and the oppression, the fire, and heavy despondency will fall aside and leave you. It is only necessary to represent to yourself and firmly believe that the Holy Ghost is everywhere, in every place, that He is an incomplex being, that in Him all heaven is near us, as upon the palm of the hand, with all its angels and saints, so that we have only to call upon the Lord, or upon the Virgin Mother of God, or any saint from the depth of the heart, with clear, sighted faith, with heartfelt repentance for the sins by which we are bound by the enemy or by which we have bound voluntarily ourselves, and our salvation will immediately shine forth. Marvelous is the saving power of Our Lady, it flows into the heart like a healing balsam, or like fragrant, life, 
giving air, or like calming water. Only look on her with the eyes of your heart, trusting in her mercy and help. But this, too, is difficult, to look on her with heartfelt, clear, sighted faith, just as it is difficult to look on the Lord Jesus Christ or the saints, for the enemy endeavors by every means to stand like a hard, high, dark wall between our souls and the Lord, or the Mother of God, the angels and saints. The accursed one does not allow the eye of the heart to see the Lord or his saints, he darkens our heart in every way, he scatters faith, oppressing, burning, and darkening us inwardly. We must look upon all such actions as illusions and falsehood, and break through this imaginary wall to the Lord, or to his Holy Mother, or his saints. As soon as you break through this wall, you will immediately be saved. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Say inwardly, from your whole heart, The Lord is everything to me, I myself am nothing, I am powerless, I am infirm. For without me ye can do nothing, says the Lord himself, for it might be added, I am everything to you. Be heartily convinced of this every moment of your life, and have recourse to the Lord absolutely in everything, trusting to obtain from him everything necessary for your salvation, and even for this temporal life besides. If the Holy Virgin, the Mother of God, through her union with God, and through her unprecedented service to the Lord of all, most speedily becomes everything to all those who ask with faith and love for her intercession, delivering them from every evil, and bestowing upon them everything which leads to their salvation, in accordance with their prayer, then will not the Lord himself do still more. Only do not be unbelieving, do not be cold to him in your soul and insensible as a stone, but stir up within you your faith, your gratitude for God's benefits, the sincere recognition of your sins, and your great love for your Saviour, together with the Father and the Holy Ghost, who loves you with an immeasurable love. When praying to the Lord, to the Mother of God, or to the saints, always remember that the Lord will give you according to your heart. He will grant thee according to thine own heart. Whatever the heart is, such will be the gift. If you pray with faith, sincerely, with all your heart, not hypocritically, then a gift will be given you by the Lord in accordance with your faith, in accordance with the degree of the fervor of your heart. And, on the contrary, the colder your heart is, the more incredulous and hypocritical it is, the more useless will be your prayer, not only this, the more it will anger the Lord, who is a spirit, and seeks to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. Therefore, whether you call upon the Lord himself, or his mother, or the angels, or saints, call upon them with all your heart, whether you pray for anyone living or departed, pray for them with your whole heart, pronouncing their names with heartfelt fervor, whether you pray that any spiritual blessing may be granted you or anyone else, that you or anyone near to you may be delivered from any misfortune, or from sins, passions, or bad habits, pray for this with your whole heart. Desiring for yourself or others with your whole heart the blessings you pray for, being firmly resolved to forsake, or desiring others to free themselves from sins, passions and sinful habits, and the Lord will grant you the gift according to your heart. Ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. You see, therefore, that it is absolutely necessary to wish and long for that which you ask, for then only you will obtain it. Pray one for another that ye may be healed. Be kindly disposed in heart, word, and deed, ready at every time to serve others without the slightest vexation or irritability, remembering the words of the Saviour, Whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Firmly believe that the Lord is at all times everything to you. During prayer he is the power and the fulfillment in the Holy Ghost of each of your words. During pious conversation he is your living water, the ardent flow of your words at all times, he is everything to you be free from care in the presence of your Lord. He has enclosed you with himself upon all sides. He penetrates you wholly and knows all your thoughts, all your needs and inclinations, and if you live in him with faith and love, then no evil shall befall you. The Lord is at hand, be careful for nothing. God, who alone is, who is omnipresent, in complex, can create or transform everything in a single instant, as it was with the wonders of Egypt. 
the Almighty can do all things. Through masterful, or rather through mercenary pride and incomprehensible wickedness, we often do not deign to speak to those whom we feed and support, often behaving inimically to them, instead of rather humbling ourselves before them as their servants, in accordance with the words of the Lord. Whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant, so as to redouble our recompense of the Lord by sincerely and unfeignedly serving him in the person of the least of his brethren. O, oh, meek and humble, hearted Creator, giver of life, Redeemer, our nourisher, and preserver, Lord Jesus. Teach us love, meekness, and humility through thy Holy Spirit, and strengthen us in those virtues which are most pleasing to thee, so that thy rich gifts may not make our hearts proud, so that we may not deem that it is we ourselves who feed, provide, and support anyone. Thou art the universal nourisher. Thou feedest, providest, supportest, and preservest all, under the wings of thy mercy, bounty, and loving-kindness all are provided for and are given rest, not under ours, for we ourselves have need of being covered with the shadow of thy wings at every moment of our life. Our eyes are fixed upon thee, our God, as the eyes of servants look unto the hand of their masters, and as the eyes of a maiden unto the hand of her mistress, even so our eyes wait upon the Lord our God, until he have mercy upon us. Amen. Be firmly convinced that every word, especially those pronounced during prayer, is realizable, remembering that the author of the word is God the Word, that our God Himself, worshipped in the Holy Trinity, is expressed by the three words or names the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, that each word has a corresponding being, or that every word can become being and deed. Therefore reverence the Word and value it. Remember that the Son of God, as the personal Word of God, is always united with the Father and the Holy Ghost, in the same manner. As the Father, as the Supreme Wisdom, participates, by His Omnipresence, His Creative Word, and the Holy Ghost the Accomplisher in the words of Holy Scripture, or in the prayers or in the writings of the Most Wise Fathers. This is why no word is vain, but has or should have power in itself. Woe to those who speak idly, for they will have to answer for their idle speaking. For with God nothing shall be impossible. Power and accomplishment are, in general, the properties of the Word. Such should it also be in the mouths of men. The Holy Ghost accomplishes all wonders and miracles. By the same Spirit power is given to one, and to another works of power. You have only to speak with faith, and need have no anxiety as to the fulfillment of the Word, the Holy Ghost will care for this. Believe firmly that you always think, feel, speak, move, and act in God, so to say, in His bosom, dwelleth in me and I in Him. He has enclosed you upon all sides, He penetrates and knows you. Thou hast beset me behind and before, and laid thine hand upon me, says the holy prophet and King David. The Mother of God, all the holy angels and all the saints are also in God. What is, therefore, nearer, who can, therefore, be more closely associated with believing Christians than the angels and saints. Therefore, call upon God Himself, the Lord of everything, as well as upon His saints, with faith, hope and love, asking them to intercede before God for you, ask the angels and saints to pray to God for you as you would ask living persons anything for yourself, standing face to face with them, firmly believing that they too stand face to face with your heart. Always think that you are accursed, poor, needy, blind and naked without God, that God is everything to you, He is your righteousness, your sanctification, your riches, your raiment, your life, your breath, everything. The body and the blood of Christ are pre-eminently body and blood, because in each smallest particle of the body and the blood rests the entire Christ, God, filling every part. It is not so in the human body. In the body and the blood of Christ every particle, every drop is Christ entire, ever indivisible, one and the same. What is mercy? Mercy is to love our enemies, to bless those who curse us, to do good to those who hate us, who do us harm, who drive us away, to defend those who are persecuted, and so on. 
God is the most easily approachable and most communicative of beings in his bounties to all his creatures, especially to reasonable beings. If air and light, owing to their rarity, move and communicate themselves easily to everything that is capable of absorbing or receiving them, then shall not the Lord of all things, the omnipresent Spirit, all, merciful, infinite, almighty, move and communicate himself infinitely more easily than these inanimate, unintelligent material created things. Oh! How quickly the Lord helps all those who believe in him and seek him. The wind bloweth where it listeth and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth, so is every one that is born of the Spirit. If human nature is communicative, then how much more so is God's nature. If a father and a mother give what is needful to their children, they being men, evil by nature, then how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? To do good and to communicate forget not. If Christ is in you through the frequent communion of the Holy Sacrament, then be yourself wholly like unto Christ, meek, humble, long, suffering, full of love, without attachment to earthly things, meditating upon heavenly ones, obedient, reasonable. Have his Spirit unfailingly within you. Do not be proud, impatient, partial to earthly things, avaricious, and covetous. See God clearly with your spiritual vision, and when thus contemplating him, ask of him anything you wish, in the name of Jesus Christ, and it shall be given to you. In one single moment God will be everything to you, for he is an incomplex being, above any time and space, and in the moments of your true faith, of your heartfelt union with him, he will accomplish everything for you that is necessary for your own salvation, or for that of your neighbor, and you yourself will at that time be a participant of the divinity, through most sincere union with him, I have said ye are gods. At such a time there is no interval between God and you, there will be no interval, either, between your word and the realization of it, as soon as you speak it will be realized, just as God himself spake, and it was done, he commanded, and it stood fast. This is equally true both in regard to the sacraments, as in general in regard to spiritual prayer. Besides this, in the sacraments everything is accomplished for the sake of the grace of the priesthood with which the priest is invested, for the sake of the great high priest himself Christ, whose image the priest bears upon himself. Therefore, although some priests are even unworthy of their office, though they may have weaknesses, though they may be suspicious, incredulous, or distrustful, nevertheless God's mystery is speedily accomplished, in the twinkling of an eye. God the Father, acting in our mind and heart through His personal Word, expressed in our Word by the Holy Ghost, resting in the personal Word, and through our Word of faith, trust, meekness, and love proceeding from our lips accomplishes in an instant, once for all, the wonderful acts predetermined since the creation of the world, of our regeneration, sanctification, strengthening, spiritual, nourishment, and healing in Christ, although the preparatory rites for these actions are very prolonged. For God is an incomplex, almighty being. For instance, the change of the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ is accomplished immediately after the utterance of the words, Make this bread the precious body of thy Christ, and that which is in this cup the precious blood of thy Christ, changing them by thy Holy Ghost. After these last words, and after the blessing, with the sign of the cross with the hand, the bread and wine are instantaneously changed into the body and blood of Christ, but not before, for the divine omnipotence awaits the word of the priest co, operating with it. For we are laborers together with God. The blessing at this time, by the sign of the cross in the name of the Lord, signifies that the mystery is accomplished by the Holy Ghost in the name of Jesus Christ, and for the sake of Jesus Christ, at his intercession, by the favor of God the Father. During the celebration of divine service, and the sacraments the servant of God should be firmly convinced that whatever he thinks and says will be accomplished. It is so easy for the Lord to fulfill our requests, to create or to change anything in accordance with our words. Let this conviction be as easy and natural to you as your breathing the air, as seeing with your eyesight, as hearing with your ears. You have a thousand times experienced upon yourself that this is really so, 
you have yourself experienced that there is no interval of time between the words, spake, and it was done, commanded, and it stood fast, that they are true in all their power. Absorb this conviction into yourself with your food and drink with your breathing. The liturgy is the supper, the table of God's love to mankind. Around the Lamb of God upon the holy disc all are at this time assembled the living and the dead, saints and sinners, the church triumphant and the church militant. There is nothing impossible unto those who believe, lively and unshaken faith can accomplish great miracles in the twinkling of an eye. Besides, even without our sincere and firm faith, miracles are accomplished, such as the miracles of the sacraments, for God's mystery is always accomplished, even though we were incredulous or unbelieving at the time of its celebration. Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? Our wickedness shall not overpower the unspeakable goodness and mercy of God, our dullness shall not overpower God's wisdom, nor our infirmity God's omnipotence. The Church is the eternal truth, because she is united with the truth, with Christ, and is animated by the Spirit of Truth, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. His body. Which is the Church, says the Apostle. You who are full of iniquities must thirst to suffer every iniquity from other people, so that the judgment of God according to truth may be manifested upon you in your present life. With what measure ye meet, to your Lord and your neighbour, it shall be measured to you again. Bear always in mind the example of that most righteous man, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who, being righteous, yet suffered every iniquity from men, was lifted up upon the cross, and died the most shameful death. Do not be faint-hearted, and do not despair when men hate you for revealing their ways, but rejoice the more, remembering the words of the Saviour, Blessed are ye when men shall hate you. Man builds himself a house, and lives in it, the animal a lair, and lives in it, the bird a nest, and hatches its young ones, the bee a hive with honeycomb, and lives in it, preparing honey for itself, the spider weaves a web, and, living in it, catches food for itself by means of it. Was it not, therefore, fitting that the Creator should build himself a house not made with hands, his body, as he built it in the womb of the Virgin Mother, as he even now creates temples for his body in the life, giving mysteries, the Creator, who has built and continues to build bodily houses for all sentient or sentiently, spiritual creatures. The priesthood, or in general holy men, are sacred reservoirs, from which the beneficial water is communicated to other believers. Out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. How pure and spiritual should be the lips of priests, who so often pronounce the most holy name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. How still more spiritual and pure should be their hearts to contain and feel in themselves the sweetness of this most precious, glorious, and justly, worshipped name. Oh, how far a priest should withdraw himself from carnal delights, so as not to become flesh, in which the Spirit of God cannot dwell. What carnal delights can there be for a priest, when he must absolutely delight in the Lord alone, so that he may grant him the petitions of his heart? What carnal delights can there be for a priest when he has so many spiritual children disclosing to him their various spiritual or bodily infirmities, with which he must heartily sympathize, concerning which he must give sincere and wholesome advice, when he must each day wrestle in prayer for them with his whole heart and with tears before the Lord? that the mental wolf may not fall upon them and ravish them, that God may grant that they may prosper in life and faith, and in spiritual wisdom. What carnal delights can there be for a priest when he must often perform the services in the church and stand before the altar of the Lord, when he has so often to celebrate the divine and most, wonderful liturgy, and to be the celebrant and partaker of the heavenly, immortal, and life, giving mysteries, when, in general, he has so often to celebrate sacraments and prayers. The heart that loves carnal delights is unfaithful to the Lord. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Ye shall know them by their fruits. By the most sweet, most blessed, and life, giving fruits of the liturgy, the most pure mysteries of the body and blood of the Lord, you will recognize that it is from God, the inspiration of the Divine Spirit, and that this most holy, life, giving spirit breathes in all its prayers and sacred rites. 
What a wonderful living tree is this divine liturgy! What leaves it has! What fruits it bears! Not only the fruits, but even the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. For who has not received great spiritual benefit, peace, and blessedness into his soul from only devoutly assisting at the divine liturgy? And that which brings forth good fruits must be in itself good, such is the law of creation. One of the most powerful wiles of the devil is to weaken the heart through slothfulness, and with it all the spiritual and bodily powers. At such times faith, hope, and love are dried up in the heart, we become faithless, despondent, insensible towards God and men, the salt has lost its savour. Only feel sincerely the need of that for which you pray and believe that every good and perfect gift comes from God and not from men, not by chance, not through circumstances nor fate, that God sees and hears all your needs, every movement of your heart and of your thoughts, that He is all, good, almighty, most wise, and that He can easily accomplish in an instant, by a single movement of His thought, through the Son in His Holy Spirit, everything that you need, and you will obtain everything. For although many things are impossible with men, they are not so with God, for with God all things are possible. Trust in prayer consists in uttering the petitions, thanksgivings, and praise with faith in the presence of God, and of His hearing them, and with the fear of God, not doubting, nor being in the least uneasy as to their acceptance and fulfilment, but in absolute assurance that God has heard them and accepted them upon His heavenly and mental altar, and that, in accordance with the desire of our Mother the Church, if we pray in the name of the Church, as well as of our own heart, He will give us, as the All. Good Almighty and Most Wise, all that we ask, and more abundantly than we ask or mean. But the heart that has a partiality for food and drink, that is greedy for these, and is weakened by them, has not such trust, neither the heart in which hatred and animosity are concealed, nor that is bound by avarice, covetousness, and envy, until it puts away its infirmities and amends itself. In signing ourselves with the sign of the cross, with the three fingers we lay the upper end of the cross upon the forehead as an emblem of God the Father, who is the uncreated wisdom, the lower end of the cross upon the bosom as an emblem of the Son who was begotten of the Father before all worlds, and which is in the bosom of the Father, and the transverse part upon the shoulders as an emblem of the Holy Ghost, which is the arm or the power of God, or the band of the Lord, as has been said. To whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed, or, the hand of the Lord was there upon me, that is, the Holy Ghost. There is, besides, an image of the Holy Trinity in man himself. The thinking mind is the image of God the Father, the heart, in which wisdom dwells and expresses itself, is the image of God the Son, the personal wisdom of God, the lips, through which that which is in the thoughts and in the heart proceeds, are the image of the Holy Ghost. He breathed on them, and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. When out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, blasphemies, then it is the evil spirit nestling in man's heart which comes forth, but when a good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good, then that is the image of the Holy Ghost proceeding from the Father through the Son. How great, therefore, is man! It has not been said in vain, I have said ye are gods, and ye are all children of the Most Highest. If he called them gods unto whom the word of God came, and the Scripture cannot be broken, that is, if it has been said, then it must be true, immutable, say ye of him whom the Father hath sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said, I am the Son of God. The Dignity. O, oh, the greatness of man! Do not look upon any man, especially upon a Christian, otherwise than as upon the Son of God, and receive him as the Son of God, converse with him, behave with him as with the Son of God, by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. A certain person who was sick unto death from inflammation of the bowels for nine days, without having obtained the slightest relief from medical aid, as soon as he had communicated of the Holy Sacrament, upon the morning of the ninth day, regained his health, and rose from his bed of sickness in the evening of the same day. He received the Holy Communion with firm faith. I prayed to the Lord to cure him. Lord, 
said I, heal thy servant of his sickness. He is worthy, therefore grant him this. He loves thy priests, and sends them his gifts. I also prayed for him in church before the altar of the Lord, at the liturgy, during the prayer, Thou who hast given us grace at this time, with one accord to make our common supplication unto Thee, and before the most holy mysteries themselves. I prayed in the following words, Lord, our life. It is as easy for Thee to cure every malady as it is for me to think of healing. It is as easy for Thee to raise every man from the dead as it is for me to think of the possibility of the resurrection from the dead. Cure, then, thy servant Basil of his cruel malady, and do not let him die, do not let his wife and children be given up to weeping. And the Lord graciously heard, and had mercy upon him, although he was within a hair's breadth of death. Glory to thine omnipotence and mercy, that thou, Lord, hast vouchsafed to hear me. The heart can change several times in one moment, to good or evil, to faith or unbelief, to simplicity or cunning, to love or hatred, to benevolence or envy, to generosity or avarice, to chastity or fornication. Oh, what inconstancy! Oh, how many dangers! Oh, how sober and watchful we must be! Do not rejoice when your countenance is bright from pleasant food and drink, because then the inward face of your soul is hideous and deadly, and at that time the words of the Saviour Christ are applicable to you, for ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which, indeed, appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones that is, of hypocrisy and iniquity. How many times already, O Master, Lord Jesus, hast thou renewed my nature, heedlessly corrupted by my sins? There is no measure and number to this. How many times hast thou saved me from the furnace burning within me, from the furnace of many and diverse passions, from the abyss of despondency and despair. How many times hast thou renewed my depraved heart, when only I have called upon thy name with faith? How many times hast thou accomplished this through the life, giving holy sacrament? O Lord! In truth there is no number and measure of thy mercies unto me, a sinner. What shall I offer to thee, or what can I render unto thee for thine innumerable benefits to me, Jesus? my life and my likeness. May I be prudent in my ways, according to thy grace, for blessed are those that are undefiled in the way, as thou hast said, through the Holy Ghost, by the mouth of our forefather, David. I will endeavour to be faithful unto thee, to be humble, meek, not irritable, gentle, forbearing, industrious, merciful, generous, not covetous, obedient. Arms, giving is good and salutary when to it is united the amendment of the heart from pride, malice, envy, slothfulness, indolence, gluttony, fornication, falsehood, deceitfulness, and other sins. But if the man is not careful to amend his heart, trusting only to his arms, then he will obtain but little benefit from them, for he builds with one hand and destroys with the other. The children Paul and Olga, by the infinite mercy of the Lord, in accordance with mine unworthy prayer, have been cured of the spirit of infirmity by which they were attacked. In the case of the child Paul, his malady passed away through sleep, and the child Olga became quiet in spirit, and her little face grew bright instead of dark and troubled. Nine times I went to pray with bold trust, hoping my trust might not be shamed, that to him that knocketh it would be opened, that even on account of my importunity, God would fulfill my requests, that if the unjust judge at last satisfied the woman who troubled him, then still more the judge of all, the most righteous judge, would satisfy my sinful prayer for the innocent children, that he would consider my labour, my intercession, my prayerful words, my kneeling, my boldness, my trust in him. And the Lord did so, he did not cover me, a sinner, with shame. I came for the tenth time to their home, and the children were well. I gave thanks unto the Lord and to our most speedy Mediatrix. That they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. What separates us from God and each other? Money, food, and drink, this dust, this dross, this corruption. 
Why? Because we have not living Christian trust and faith in God. We do not know, or we forget, that man's true life is love for God and his neighbor. Setting our life upon dust and trusting in it, we do not render to the Heavenly Father the glory that is due to Him, by putting our whole trust in Him, by casting all our care upon Him, as His faithful children in Christ should do. If then I be a father, where is mine honor? Where is your trust in me? Where is your love for me? Where is your detachment from earthly, corrupt things, and your hearty desire for the heavenly, spiritual, and eternal ones? While I live, then the flesh is mine own, because my spirit lives in it, but when I die, the flesh is no longer mine, but belongs to God and to the earth, the earth is the Lord's and all that therein is. For dust thou art and unto dust shalt thou return. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood. These words also signify that I myself wholly dwell in these two forms of the communion, in the flesh and blood, that they are mine by their close association with me, as the flesh and blood of the man, with the soul of the man dwelling in them, for the soul penetrates all the body and all the blood. How many times death entered into my heart, communicating its beginning to the body also an innumerable number of times. And yet the Lord delivered me from this state of death, was merciful to me with unspeakable mercy, and gave me new life. Oh, how full of gratitude to the Lord my heart should be! If the Lord had not helped me, it had not failed, but my soul had been put to silence. Our flesh becomes depressed and downcast when it is subjected to any infirmities, whilst when it is in good health and enjoys carnal pleasures, then it rejoices, leaps, and gets beyond itself. We must pay no attention to the delusive feelings of the flesh, and, in general, must disdain every carnal amusement, and delight, we must bear with equanimity the afflictions and maladies of the flesh, take courage and set our trust upon God. Why is impatience in some small, unimportant matter, one single movement of the heart towards impatience, already a sin, and is immediately inwardly punished? Likewise, why is every momentary movement of the heart towards sin considered as a sin and immediately punished? Because impatience in a small matter is an earnest of impatience in great and important matters, for the soul of man is incomplex, and one single inclination of the heart towards sin is already a sin. And therefore, as every small, unimportant sin leads to great ones, it is always punished at its very beginning and must be crushed. Thou hast been faithful over a few things, I will make thee ruler over many things, enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. And how great are these many things! I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. When praying, endeavour by every means to feel in your heart the truth and the power of the words of the prayer, feed yourself upon them as upon an imperishable food, water your heart with them as with a dew, and warm yourself by them as by means of a beneficial fire. The Lord is everything to me, He is the strength of my heart, and the light of my intellect. He inclines my heart to everything good, He strengthens it, He also gives me good thoughts, He is my rest and my joy, He is my faith, hope and love, He is my food and drink, my raiment, my dwelling place. As a mother is everything to her infant, its mind, will, sight, hearing, taste, smelling and feeling, as well as its food and drink, its clothing, hands and feet, so, likewise, the Lord is everything to me, when I yield myself wholly unto Him. But, alas! When I fall away from the Lord, then the devil enters into me, and if I did not turn my heart's gaze towards the Lord, did I not, amidst the enemy's oppression, call upon the Lord for help, then the devil would have been, as he sometimes is, very evil to me, malice, despondency, perfect feebleness towards everything good, despair, hatred, envy, avarice, blasphemous, wicked and impure thoughts, contempt for everything, in short, he would have been, and sometimes is, my intellect, my will, sight, hearing, taste, smell, feeling, my hands and feet. Therefore, put your trust in the Lord. He is that which is, infinite in holiness, omnipotence, 
grace, mercy, bountifulness, and wisdom. When your flesh suffers through maladies, remember that it is the greatest enemy of your salvation that suffers, that is weakened by these sufferings, and bear them bravely in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, who for our sakes endured the cross and suffered death, also, remember that all our maladies are God's punishment for sins, they cleanse us, they reconcile us with God and lead us back to His love. Grant us Thy peace, it is said, and Thy love, as Thou hast granted us all things. Remember, that during your illness the Lord Himself is with you, I am with Him in trouble, that it has proceeded from a sign of the Master, punishing us as a Father. You who believe in the time of your welfare, see that you do not fall away from God in the time of misfortune, but, like the martyrs, be constant in faith, hope, and love. God is an incomplex most perfect being, that is, the purest holiness, the purest good and truth, and in order to be in union with God, in order to be one spirit with Him, for we are from Him, we must acquire, through His grace, the most perfect simplicity of goodness, holiness, and love. All the saints who are in heaven were cleansed by the blood of the Son of God, through the Holy Ghost, and have not a shadow of sin in them. It was for this that they struggled in this life, that they mortified their flesh in order to cleanse themselves, from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God, in order to become eternally united with that most glorious being, it is for this reason also that the Holy Church with all her institutions now exists upon earth, the hierarchy, the divine services, the sacraments, the rites, fasts were likewise appointed in order to cleanse and sanctify the children of God. In order to unite them with that most blessed being, glorified in the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. You ask the Lord that you may love Him with a love, strong as death, or until death. Suppose, now, that the Lord sends you a terrible inward disease that may bring you nigh unto death itself. Do not, then, murmur against the Lord, but bear it bravely, thanking the Lord for His fatherly visitation, and this will show that what you call your love for God is strong as death. And during the most violent fits or spasms of your illness trust in God, that He has the power to save you, not only from suffering, but even from death itself, should it please Him to do so. Do not spare, do not cherish your perishable body, but give it up willingly and wholly to the Lord, as Abraham gave his son Isaac as an holocaust, to the will of the Lord who punishes you, not losing faith in God's goodness, not growing despondent, not foolishly accusing God of injustice for so severely chastising you, and you will thus offer a great sacrifice unto God, like Abraham or like the martyrs. Let that which tranquilizes my thoughts and my heart be committed to writing as a memorial to me of the constant peace of my heart amidst the cares and vanities of life. What is it? It is the Christian saying, full of living trust and wonderful soothing power, the Lord is everything to me. This is the priceless treasure. This is the precious jewel, possessing which we can be calm in every condition, rich in poverty, generous and kind to other people in the time of our wealth, and not losing hope even after having sinned. The Lord is everything to me. He is my faith, my trust, my love, my strength, my power, my peace, my joy, my riches, my food, my drink, my raiment, my life, in a word, mine all. Thus, man, the Lord is everything to you, and you must be everything to the Lord. And, as all your treasure is contained in your heart and in your will, and God requires from you your heart, having said, My son, give me thine heart, therefore, in order to fulfill God's gracious and perfect will, renounce your own corrupt, passionate, seductive, will, do not know your own will, know only God's will. Not my will, but thy will be done. There is absolutely nothing for a Christian to be proud of in accomplishing works of righteousness, for he is saved, and is being constantly saved, from every evil through faith alone, in the same manner as he accomplishes works of righteousness also by the same faith. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that, faith itself not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So that no one can be proud of anything. It is only when we pray fervently, only then that we feel calm, 
warm, at ease, and bright in soul, because then we are with God and in God, but as soon as we cease thus praying, then temptations and various troubles begin. O, oh, most blessed time of prayer! Love for God begins to manifest itself and act in us when we begin to love our neighbor as ourselves, and not to spare either ourselves or anything belonging to us for him, as the image of God, when we endeavor to serve him for his salvation in everything that we can, when, for the sake of pleasing God, we refuse to gratify our appetites, our carnal vision, our carnal wisdom, which is not subjected to the wisdom of God. For he that loveth not his brother, whom he hath seen, how can he love God, whom he hath not seen? They that are Christ's have crucified the flesh, with the affections and lusts. Ask the Lord for whatever you desire. God the Father has but to desire to accomplish your request. The Son, the Creator, and the Holy Ghost, the Accomplisher, being always with Him and in Him, as He Himself is in them, are always ready to accomplish the desire of the Almighty and all, good Father, for they themselves are one with Him in goodness and omnipotence. You ought not to keep God's gifts to yourself, but should diffuse them upon others. Nature herself is an example to you, the sun does not keep the light to itself, but diffuses it upon the earth and moon. Pastors especially ought not to keep their, or, rather, God's, light to themselves, but should abundantly diffuse the light of their intelligence and knowledge upon others. With what are our hearts occupied? God, who trieth the very hearts and reins, sees what each one of us has in his heart, to what it is attached, during the greater part of life, and if the Lord had given us the capability of seeing all the depths of the human heart, then our eyes would have turned away with horror from the mass of impurities within, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies, pride, and others. What abomination we should have beheld! The abomination of ingratitude to God, of forgetfulness of God, of unbelief, of little faith, of manifold attachments to earthly things often the most absurd ones, of carelessness for heavenly things, of our own lot after death, of inattention and neglect of the church, of her services, rites, and institutions, of contempt for the clergy, the representatives of religion and the church, and every other abomination. It is impossible to represent and to think of the cross without love. Where the cross is, there is love, in the church you see crosses everywhere and upon everything, in order that everything should remind you that you are in the temple of the God of love, in the temple of love itself, crucified for us. People say that if you feel no inclination to pray, it is better not to pray, but this is crafty, carnal sophistry. If you only pray when you are inclined to, you will completely cease praying, this is what the flesh desires. The kingdom of heaven suffereth violence you will not be able to work out your salvation without forcing yourself. In educating, it is extremely dangerous to only develop the understanding and intellect, and not pay attention to the heart. We must, above all pay attention to the heart, for the heart is life, but life corrupted by sin. It is necessary to purify this source of life, to kindle in it the pure flame of life, so that it should burn and not be extinguished, and should direct all the thoughts, desires, and tendencies of the man through all his life. Society is corrupted precisely through the want of Christian education. It is time that Christians should understand the Lord, should understand what he requires of us, namely, a pure heart. Blessed are the pure in heart. Listen to his sweetest voice in the Gospel. The true life of our heart is Christ, Christ liveth in me. Let all of you learn wisdom of the Apostle. This should be our common problem, to bring Christ to dwell in our hearts through faith. These hands, that like to take gifts, shall be folded upon the breast and shall take no more, these feet, that like to walk for evil, and that do not like to stand in prayer, shall be stretched out for ever, and shall not go anywhere more, these eyes, that look enviously upon the prosperity of their neighbor, shall close, their fire shall be dim for ever, and nothing shall charm them again, their hearing, so often open to listen with pleasure to evil speaking and calumny, shall be deadened, and no thunders even will be audible to it. It shall only hear the trumpet raising the dead, 
when our incorruptible body shall rise, either unto the resurrection of life or unto the resurrection of damnation. What, then, will live in us, even after our death, and what should be the object of all our care during our present life? That which we now call the heart, that is, the inward man, our soul, it should be the object of our solicitude. Cleanse your heart during all your life, so that it, or your soul, may be capable of seeing God afterwards, only care for your body and its requirements as much as is necessary for maintaining its health, power, and decency. It will all die, the earth will bear it all away. Strive, therefore, to perfect within you that which loves and hates, that which is calm or disturbed, which rejoices or grieves, that is, your heart or your inward man, which thinks and reasons through your intellect. Men throughout all their earthly life see everything but Christ, the life, giver, this is why they have no spiritual life, this is why they are given to every passion, unbelief, want of faith, covetousness, envy, hatred, ambition, the pleasures of eating and drinking. It is only at the close of their life that they seek Christ through the Holy Communion, and even this out of crying necessity and as a custom usual amongst others. O Christ, our God, our life and resurrection! How low have we fallen in our vanity, how blind have we become! But how would it have been with us had we always sought Thee, had we always had Thee in our hearts? The tongue cannot express the bliss which those experience who have Thee in their hearts. Unto them Thou art strengthening food, inexhaustible drink, shining raiment, the sun, the peace which passeth all understanding, unutterable joy, and everything. Possessing thee, all earthly things become dust and corruption. It is the Spirit that quickeneth. It is to the Spirit of the Lord in creatures that their animation belongs, since the time of their creation, and to the Son of God their creation, the bringing of them into existence from non-existence. This is also how the body and the blood of Christ are transubstantiated by the Holy Ghost from the bread and wine, in the same manner as a body was created by the Holy Ghost in the womb of the most, pure virgin from her blood. The Holy Ghost creates us in the womb of our mother, it is to the Spirit of God that we owe our spiritual blessings. The kingdom of life and the kingdom of death go side by side. I say go, because they are spiritual. The chief of the first, that is, of the kingdom of life, is Jesus Christ, and those who are with Christ are undoubtedly in the kingdom of life, the chief of the second, that is, of the kingdom of death, is the prince of the powers of the air the devil, with the spirits of evil subject to him, of which there are so many that their number far exceeds the number of all men dwelling upon earth. These children of death, the subjects of the prince of the air, are in constant stubborn warfare with the children of life, that is, with faithful Christians, and strive by every crafty means to win them over to their side, through the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, because sin and crime are their elements, and through sins, if we do not repent of them, we pass over to their side, whilst those to whom sins form as though in every, day requirement, who drink in iniquity like water, are not disturbed by the spirits of evil, because they already belong to them as long as they live carelessly in regard to their souls. But as soon as they turn to God, acknowledging their sins, both voluntary and involuntary, the war bursts forth, and the hordes of Satan rise up and carry on an unceasing fight. You see by this how necessary it is to seek Christ, as the chief of the kingdom of life, and the conqueror of hell and death. Every affliction and oppression arises either from want of faith, or from some passion concealing itself within the man, or from some other impurity visible to the Almighty, and shows that the devil is in the heart, and that Christ is not in the heart. Christ is the peace, the freedom, and the ineffable light of the soul. The air, the blowing of the wind, the breathing of creatures in the material world correspond to the spirits in the spiritual world, and to the uncreated, all life, giving spirit of God itself. This is why the spirit manifested itself as a rushing mighty wind, this is why also the Saviour compares the breathing of the Spirit in the souls of those who are born of the Spirit, to the blowing of wind. In the material world there are many things that correspond to those of the spiritual world, 
because the material world is also the creation of the spirit, and cannot the creating spirit in part show his image and his affinity in the creatures created by him. Man is only the highest possible image of God amongst creatures, partakers of matter and purely material. Kissing with the lips corresponds to kissing with the soul, and when we kiss holy things we ought to kiss them with the soul and heart as well as the lips. The Lord rules wonderfully and mightily over material worlds by means of His wisdom, by means of His word. As the particles of the body of an animal, of a tree, of grass, of stone are held together by cohesion, so all the worlds are held together by the powers and laws laid in them. As the soul carries the body and gives life to it, so also God carries the world, giving life to it through His Holy Spirit, it is not without reason that a man is called a little world. What an insignificant cobweb the world must be to God! What an insignificant cobweb is my body! And yet all is wisdom in every point of matter, and all stands only by wisdom, by the eternal laws of wisdom. Oh, wisdom, wisdom! We all owe our being to Thee, to Thy merciful Author. My death, my decomposition or destruction, clearly proves what an insignificant cobweb Thou hast in me. Glory to Thee, Life, giving Father, Life, giving Son, and Life, giving Holy Ghost, in complex being, God, ever saving us from the spiritual death caused to our soul by passions. Glory to Thee, Lord, in three persons, who enlightenest the dark face of our soul and body, and bestowest upon us Thy peace, which exceeds every earthly and physical good, and surpasses all understanding. Pray without ceasing, calling upon the name of the life, giving Trinity in order that your soul should not be suddenly overwhelmed by any passion, pride, or envy, or malice and hatred, or avarice, or covetousness, or gluttony, or anger and irritability, or harsh judgment or scorn, or falsehood and calumny, or any such passion, for we walk amongst snares every hour, every minute of our life. Let the eyes of your heart be on guard every hour, every minute. Let your heart be watchful, not only during the day, but also during the night, in accordance with, the Scripture. I sleep, but my heart waketh. We must love our neighbour still more when he sins against God, or against ourselves, because then he is sick, because then he is in spiritual misfortune, in danger, then, especially, we must have compassion upon him, pray for him, and apply to his heart a healing plaster, a word of kindness, instruction, reproval, consolation, forgiveness, love. Forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. All sins and passions, quarrels and disputes, are truly spiritual diseases, that is how we must look upon them. Or, all passions are a fire of the soul, a great fire, raging inwardly, a fire proceeding from the abyss of hell. It must be extinguished by the water of love, which is strong enough to extinguish every infernal flame of malice and of other passions. But woe and misfortune to us, to ourself, love, if we increase this flame by a fresh infernal flame, by our own malice and irritability, and thus make ourselves the assistants of the spirits of evil, ever endeavouring to inflame the souls of men by means of many and various passions. If we do so, we ourselves shall deserve the fire of Gehenna, and if we do not repent, and do not become in future wise unto good and simple unto evil, then we shall be condemned, together with the devil and his angels, to torments in the lake of fire. Therefore, do not let us be overcome of evil, but let us overcome evil with good. How accursed are we men! How is it that we have not yet learned to consider every sin as a great misfortune for our soul, and not to pity, heartily, sincerely, lovingly, those who fall into such a misfortune? Why do we not flee from it as from poison, as from a serpent? Why do we linger in it? Why have we no pity upon ourselves, too, when we are subjected to any sin? Why do we not weep before the Lord, who created us? The Lord allows us to be tossed by various passions in this life in order that we may hate these passions with all our heart, that we may look upon everything earthly as nothing, however precious and pleasant it may appear, and that we may long with all our hearts for God alone, the source of tranquility and life, 
may cling to him alone, may value him before everything, his holy will, his peace and joy. You feel straightened upon earth from all sides. Everything betrays you, your relations, friends, acquaintances, riches, the pleasures of the senses, your own body, all the elements, earth, water, fire, air, light, play you false. Cling, therefore, to God alone, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning, who alone is love. It is remarkable that some irritable people, after an agony of violent and prolonged anger, and after having experienced all its torments, become, as they say, silky, meek, and peaceable. The same applies to the other passions. The Lord Himself has pointed out that their punishment lies in themselves, in their extreme agony. Pride, envy, hatred, avarice, covetousness, all are thus punished. Each passion is its own tormentor, and at the same time the executioner of each man possessed with it. Follow peace with all men, and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Do not break peace for the sake of anything perishable and transitory, for the sake of your sinful self, love. Love peace above everything as the Lord Himself. Let nothing be dearer than peace and mutual love. Let us love peace. The human soul is a free power, for it can become either a power for good or evil, according to the direction which you yourself give it. Lord, Almighty Power! Strengthen mine infirm soul in every virtue. Establish my heart, weak for everything good, upon the immovable rock of thy commandments. Lord, I daily recognize, through experience, that without thee I myself am nothing, that without thee I can do no good, without thee evil in its various forms is alone within me, without thee I am the son of perdition. O unspeakably good one, fill my heart with thy goodness. But above all, I pray thee, grant that I may love thee with all my heart and my neighbour as myself. Grant that I may be neither malicious, proud, presumptuous, nor disobedient, but grant that I may be gentle, humble, tenderly respectful, and obedient. Amen. O, oh, how carefully do the devil and the world sow their tears in Christ's cornfield, which is the Church of God. Instead of the Word of God, the Word of the world, the Word of vanity, is sown? Instead of the Temple of God, the world has invented its own temples the temples of the world's vanities theatres, circuses, assemblies. Instead of holy icons, which worldly people do not accept, in the world there are painted and photographic portraits, illustrations, and various other pictures. Instead of God and the saints, the world honors unto adoration its own celebrities writers, actors, singers, painters, who command general confidence and respect up to reverence. Poor Christians! They have completely fallen away from Christ. Instead of spiritual raiment, every attention is paid in the world to perishable clothing, to fashionable dresses, and various exquisite ornaments, both splendid and costly. In sickness and, in general, during bodily infirmity, as well as in affliction, a man cannot in the beginning burn with faith and love for God, because in affliction and sickness the heart aches, whilst faith and love require a sound heart, a calm heart. This is why we must not very much grieve if during sickness and affliction we cannot believe in God, love Him, and pray to Him fervently as we ought to. Everything has its proper time. There may be an unfavorable time even for praying. Behave to your neighbor with a perfect heart, that is, truthfully and with the same love as you would have for your own self, so that your neighbor, on his part, may love you in return, and even if he does not love you, he will at least respect in you your virtue, will honor it, and will himself emulate it. Would a beggar, who is fed upon crumbs from his master's table, be proud of being fed upon his crumbs? What is there for him to be proud of? Of his poverty. The beggar is myself, the master is the Lord, the crumbs from his table are all beneficial and natural gifts. What is the sign that a Christian man is near to Christ? The man who is near to Christ often turns with faith and love to Christ, often pronounces his sweetest name, often calls upon him for help, often turns his eyes, thoughts and heart towards him. 
Christ the Lord naturally reveals himself upon his lips and in his glance, because without Christ he is powerless, joyless. The man who is far from Christ seldom, very seldom, turns his thoughts toward Christ, and even then not with hearty faith and love, but only through some necessity, and as to a person who is little known to him, who does not rejoice him, does not delight his heart, and who has no attraction for him. This is why we see that those who are near to Christ do not let Christ out of their thoughts and heart, they live in him, he is their breath, food, drink, dwelling, everything. Through the sweetness of his name and his beneficial touch they, so to say, cleave to him with their whole being, my soul hangeth upon thee. And in this cleaving they find unspeakable bliss, which the world does not know. Such are the signs by which it may be recognized who has found Christ and who has not yet found him. Those who have not found Christ live in this life without hearty faith, they think and care more about worldly things, how to enjoy themselves, how to eat and drink pleasurably, how to dress exquisitely, how to satisfy their carnal desires, how to kill time, with which they do not know what to do, though time seeks them and, not finding them, quickly flies away before their eyes. Day flies away after day, night after night, month after month, year after year, until, finally, the last terrible hour strikes, and they hear a voice, Stop, the course is finished, your time has been lost, your sins and iniquities have preceded you, they will fall upon you with all their power, and will crush you with their weight eternally. What does to seek distraction mean? It means to wish to somehow fill the sickly emptiness of the soul, which was created for activity, and which cannot bear to be idle. Let all knowledge relating to religion or faith be as though always new to you, that is, having the same importance, holiness, and interest. The Lord is the perfect owner and master of all creatures, and we know that his commands and his will are obeyed by all creatures, by the angels and by men having understanding hearts, by heaven, earth, and all that is in them, even by hell and all that is therein. He commands the angels, and they hasten to fulfill his will, he commands them to be guardians of new, born men, and they guard them during all their life, not transgressing his commands in anything. He commands the heavens, and they either give forth rain and dew, or snow and hail, or keep them back, he commands the winds, the waters, and they obey him, he commands the fire, and it obeys him, he commands the sun, and it is obscured or shines upon everything under it, warming and lighting it, he commands the earth, and it germinates various kinds of plants, he commands it to cease growing, and the growth ceases, he commanded the waters to flow unrestrainably upon the earth, and they did so. As in the time of the universal deluge, he commands the winds, and they blow, they rage furiously, and sometimes become destructive, as a punishment for our sins, he commanded the sea, whale to devour the prophet Jonah, and it was ready to seize him, he commanded the fishes to fill his disciples' nets, and the fishes rushed into the nets, rushed to obey the Creator's commands, he commands the dead to rise, to live it again, and death flees from the man and life again appears in him. He commands the disease to leave a sick man, and the disease departs, and the sick man rises up healthy and sound, he commands the demons, and they obey incontestably. Great is the name of the Lord, praised be the name of the Lord, most glorious is the name of the Lord. He can change at his pleasure the objects created by him, for instance, water into blood, water into wine, a rod into a living serpent, or, again, a rod into a living tree, a man into a pillar, as in the case of Lot's wife, a serpent into gold, and, again, gold into a serpent, as the Lord did at the prayer of Street Spiedon of Triumphant. But the Lord's power and sovereignty are especially manifested when he converts a sinful man into a wholly chosen vessel after he had terribly fallen, when he restores, raises, and renews the depraved, when he gives life to the man who was dead in soul and body, and leads into eternal life him, who had fallen into eternal death this is indeed the miracle of miracles, this reveals the infinite mercy, wisdom, and omnipotence of the Lord in relation to his creatures, or, above all, that he himself, the Lord of all creatures, the infinite, the uncontainable, was pleased and was able to become man for our salvation, and that the Word, by whom all things were made, was made flesh, and dwelt among us, 
living with men and being like unto man in everything, except sin. The heavens were in awe, and the ends of the earth were astonished, that God appeared as man in the flesh. He conversed with men, loaded us with benefits, worked innumerable miracles, suffered, oh, wonder, died, oh, awful wonder, and rose again, raising with himself us also, who were dead in Adam. I glorify thy most merciful, holy, almighty, and most wise power, Lord. Show upon me, also, Lord, thy wonderful power, and, by ways known unto thee, save me, thine unworthy servant, disregarding my trespasses, voluntary and involuntary, committed in knowledge or ignorance, guiding me ever in thy way, and strengthening me upon this way by thy grace, and through me the others for whom thou hast placed me as a light, shepherd, teacher, and priest. When you partake of the immortal food and drink, the body and blood of the Lord, raise your grateful heart to the Lord and say, I thank thee, Lord, bread of life and source of immortality, for giving unto us thy body and blood for our food and drink, so that we, cleansed and sanctified here by them, may enter into thine eternal kingdom, may eternally delight in the contemplation of thy countenance, and thy blessed life. Do not suffer me, Lord, to care only for bodily food and drink, do not suffer me, Lord, to become attached to them, but grant that I may cleave to thee alone. When you partake of perishable sweet things, thank the Lord, saying, I thank thee, sweetness eternal, incomparable, infinitely surpassing all earthly sweetness, which are carnal and gross. Thou art the sweetness imperishable, life, giving, holy, tranquil, light, most peaceful, most joyful, inexhaustible, I thank thee also for granting me these perishable sweet things to partake of and enjoy, so that through them I may learn, although only in part, how sweet thou art, thou who art all sweetness, and how greatly thou art to be desired. Enlightened by the material light, say, Glory to thee, light that never sets, most sweet, and giving joy to everything, for this perishable but beautiful light, for lighting us by this image of thine inaccessible divine light, so that from this material light our thoughts may unceasingly pass to thee, the eternal light that never sets, and may aspire to attain through purity of life to the most blessed contemplation of thyself. When you breathe the air with your lungs, that vivifying and refreshing element, constantly necessary for the support of our perishable life, again raise yourself in thought to the life, giving Lord, the Holy Ghost, with the Father and the Son, by whom we live, move, and exist, thanking Him for uninterrupted breath, and know, that as the body cannot live without air, so your soul cannot for an instant lead the true life without the Holy Ghost. And by pure and temperate living strive constantly to be in communion with God Himself, for without Him the soul dies. Thus from every created thing or being raise yourself continually to the Creator, thank Him for everything, and do not cling to any creature, do not serve any creature more than the Creator Himself, for service or slavery to creatures and attachment to earthly things is idolatry.